Overwatch League is back. But this time, it's anyone's game. The top pros will be challenged by rising contenders. Can David topple Goliath? Grant oh, taking down Ben Hay out of the fight. Finds the shot, gets another. Postal gets thrown out. Howdy, hit those. New challengers have emerged. Oh my God, look at the man cook. But legends stand in their way. I'm still hungry. Oh, Jailer, you best get up early if you want to come at the king like that. You're talking about it. Oh my word. Edison, still game over. There's no power up. Oh, oh no. Oh, but he doesn't have his ground beneath his feet. Oh, he kills as soon as he respawns. <laughs> This is the Overwatch League Pro-Am. Hello and welcome to Watchpoint. We've got a great show for you today as we preview all the action coming your way on day number six of the Overwatch League Pro-Am. And joining me today are none other than the ever-reliable Danny, desk protagonist Lim, and making his Pro-Am desk debut, the Associate Director of Owl Product, recurring <laughs> Esports Caster of the Year nominee, our resident artist in a pinch, also voice actor, Mr. X. That's, uh, topple that's, Goliath. that's me. Uh, yeah. yeah, we're gonna find out today if David can topple Goliath. Because uh, well, we only have one Overwatch League versus Overwatch League match, right? I think the rest are uh, either Overwatch League versus contenders or uh, contenders versus contenders. Yeah, lots of Davids uh, around town. So let's see if one of the Davids yeah. will come out victorious or not. Let's take a look at where things stand first, though, in our groups. This is week number two of our group stage. As you can see, Florida and Atlanta stand atop of group A and B, while Houston Outlaws, they had a strong start in their Pro-Am debut yesterday, which brings me to that first item on our Watchpoint agenda, Outlaws. Uh, those uh, guys were our pick on day number one to win the whole thing. We're very eager to jump on that hype train, but based on what we saw from them just yesterday, um, what are the odds of that actually happening, you guys think? I, I'll start first. I think it's really, really high. Almost almost 100%, <laughs> but not quite. So like 99%? Like. 99.9%, <laughs> okay. I'd say. Ooh. Because, hey, they had great looks when they were playing against Toronto Defiant and their other matches as well. They played two matches. They're two and zero right now. Uh, talking to Pelican after his uh, after they won the match, uh, he did say they were worried about uh, Toronto Defiant. But after beating them, he was like, "Hey, you know, rest of the team, it's gonna be an easy dub for us." And it does look to be that way. Like all the players on that team, they're superstar players. Fearless, as we're seeing now, on that Winston was just amazing. And just their backline. Hugh and Violet on that backline is just too menacing. And so, you know, with all that given, I think Houston Outlaws definitely has a great chance of just, you know, making it out with 4 0 victory. Yeah, well, Matt, we yeah, haven't gotten I mean, your thoughts yet on the Houston Outlaws. Well, I was just listening to Danny just go, go on about how they have a 100% <laughs> chance to win the whole 99. league. 99.9. Uh, 99. Don't put words in his sure. mouth. 99.9. Well, yeah. Round it up. Uh, I mean, yeah. look, I, I think the Outlaws obviously are like an extremely talented team, uh, like maybe the most talented team we have in the league on paper. Uh, but it's a long season. Uh, it, it, historically, it's always been Houstonable, right? So uh, I always worry a little bit there. Um, I, I don't. I wouldn't put it at 99.9. .9. I think there's probably uh, a little bit of better chance for the field than just 0.1%. Uh, but they do look like they have the best team on paper. They do indeed. Uh, and now, how, once about, how about Atlanta? Reminder, oh, sorry. Oh, Atlanta is pretty good too. Well, so. You oh, can't second? offer another team after you said everybody else has 0.1% <laughs> chance. Then you're like, well, what about that team? Like, <laughs> it's no Atlanta. 0.1% though. <laughs> All right, no more. Sorry. All right. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> Math with Danny. <laughs> it's going places. Uh, just a quick reminder, everyone watching, that if Houston Outlaws clinch the first uh, spot, uh, the top spot in their group, they will actually be facing off against the San Francisco Shock in the first round of the bracket. That's single elimination. So that might be a pretty good match. Maybe. Hopefully. We'll see. Uh, now, however, that we gassed them up some more and got everyone tuning in eager to see the Outlaws play, 
what do you want? <laughs> Lol. Because uh, they will be back tomorrow. Today, we have different <laughs> matches for you. So let's take a look at the schedule. This is what's coming your way. We're going to see Redbird Esports as well as Boston Uprising making their 2023 appearance debut today. And we get to see a new look Boston Uprising today. And that means Bird Ring is Ooh. back after a hiatus last season. And guess what? Birdring will actually be joining us live for a quick interview. Whoa. But first, let's get you hyped up with the official announcement from this legend from the Boston Uprising. Birdring is joining the Boston Uprising in 2023. He'll be unretiring, giving many of the players in the league who were sad they'd missed that opportunity uh, to play with or against him uh, one more shot to play alongside a grand champion and, and really an icon in the league. Birdring is fantastically talented on the server, but is also someone who, through his attitude and leadership, you can rally around and feel like matches are always winnable when he's on your team. We're extremely Extremely excited. Everyone that we spoke to had only the best things to say about Bird Ring. We think he really has the Boston Uprising attitude we were searching for, and we're excited to watch him play in 2023. That was pre from the Boston Uprising, and ladies and gentlemen, we have Bird Ring from Boston Uprising joining for a quick interview. Uh, Bird Ring, thank you so much for taking this time. Uh, can you hear me? Hello, and and yes, of course. Hello. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How have you been, Birdwing? Uh, How have you been? 지난 1 년간 그냥 뭐 그냥 저랑 지냈던 것 같아요. 다시 돌아오게 돼서 좀 반갑네요. 대니 형 얼굴도 보고. Uh, I mean, it's, it's been about a year since my retirement. It's really good to be back. I'm, you know, I just spent a lot of time doing my personal things. So it's really good to be back in the uh, Overwatch League. You know, it's good to see familiar faces like Danny and just, you know, all around. Uh, it's, it's good to be back. I mean, I think my first question for you, Bird Ring, uh, is just that, uh, you know, you were out of the league. You were you retired and for about a year, you said you did a lot of personal stuff. What are some of the things that you did after your retirement? In your retirement, I guess. Uh, 방금 보여드린 선수가 말씀하셨다시피 일단 저도 다시 봐서 너무나도 반갑고요. 어 이제 은퇴를 하고 나서 한 1년 정도가 지났는데 그 은퇴한 시간에 좀 이것저것 하셨다고 하셨는데 그좀더 이것저것이 뭐에 대, 뭐 뭐였는지 좀 여쭤보고 싶어서 좀 어떤 일들이 있었나요? 이제 어, 은퇴를 하고 나신 후에 어 사실 이제 다른 게임에서 이제 프로 게이머를 도전하고자 뭐 잠깐 준비도 해봤었는데 일단 뭐 다시 오버치에 돌아오게 된 계기는 사실 이제 어 팀에서 뭐 현재 팀이 아닌 뭐 다른 팀에서 뭐 오버치를 다시 할 생각이 있느냐부터 시작해가지고 거기서부터 이제 제가 다시 오버치 시작하게 됐고 그때부터 그냥 원래 하던 걸 접고 다시 오버치 프로를 준비하는데 이제 다시 준비를 한것 같습니다. 그 이렇게 이제 다른 팀들이 얘기를 하셨다고 했는데 좀 이름 좀 한두 팀이 아니고 굉장히 많은 팀들이 있었나 봐요. 버드링 선수. 이렇게 좀 얘기가 와 아, 오는 게 많은 팀은 아니고요. 아, 두팀 정도 있었어. <웃음> 아, 두팀 정도. 알겠습니다. All right. Uh uh Birdring says that you know, uh he was after his retirement, he was actually preparing uh to become a pro in other games as well. But while he was doing that, while he was on the grind for other games to become a pro, uh there were a couple teams, actually two uh teams that gave him an offer from the Overwatch League sites uh asking Birdring, "Hey, do you want to come back and play for our team?" So, you know, after getting those offers and after he was weighing the differences, he thought it was a good chance for him to come back and become a pro again in the Overwatch League. All right. Now, I mean, we do have to also talk about your new team, the Boston Uprising. I am super excited for this team. This team is stacked. Birdwing, how does it feel to be in such a, I guess, superstar filled team, the new Boston Uprising? 자, 다음 질문은 버드링 선수. 당연히 버드링 선수도 너무나 굉장한 선수고. 하지만 이번 시즌 보스턴 팀이 어좀 상당합니다. 지금 라인업이 좀 굉장한데 이런 좀 많은 스타가 있는 많은 굉장한 선수, 쟁쟁한 선수들이 많은 팀에 소속돼 있는 멤버로서 좀 어떠신가요? 일단 이 팀에 제가 합류하게 됐을 때 굉장히 어 원래 이제 저보다 일찍 들어온 선수들 로스터를 봤을 때 굉장히 어 영광이다라고 생각을 했었고 개개인 이름만 들어도 이름, 이름값들이 된, 굉장히 이제 높은 선수들이잖아요. 그래서 그에 맞는 저도 이제 1년 쉬다 왔지만 1년 쉬지 않은 것 같은 모습을 보이면서 요즘 팀원들, 팀원들한테 짐이 되지 않아야겠다 약간 그런 생각을 하고 있습니다. 
Mm. Right, I mean, definitely just checking by the names on that roster. I just, you know, checking all the names that were previously signed before I joined the team, I was just super honored to have have received that offer from Boston Uprising. And just the pure name value of, of all these players is just so amazing. So just being a part of that team is such an honorable thing. And I feel like my goal in this whole season and what I want to do for the Boston Uprising is, you know, of course I had one rest, uh, one year of rest, so I do not want to be a burden and I'm just going to try my best uh, as one of the Boston Uprising team players. All right, final question for you, Bird Ring. Of course, you were talking a little bit about yourself and Boston Uprising. What can we expect from uh, Bird Ring and the Boston Uprising? 자, 마지막 질문입니다. 어, 버딩 선수 이번 보스턴 어프라이징에서 좀 어떤 모습을 기대할 수 있을까요? 어, <웃음> 최고의 히트 스캔이 될수 있도록 보스턴에서 어, 노력하도록 하겠습니다. <웃음> My goal is simple. I am going to try my best to become the best hit scan player in the Overwatch League and, of course, in the Boston Uprising as well. All right, I'm going to end the interview right here, Birdry. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, thank you. Chat, Birdry, so you go to interview. Bye, Chidoro. Kagasamda. Kamsamda. Kamsamda. Fighting. Thank you so much, Birdring. Thank you so much, Danny. It is so great to have him back. I actually I didn't even know how much I missed that, that face of his until yeah. uh, I just got to see it again. So yeah, great stuff. Can't wait to see what he and the Boston Uprising have in store for us. Now, if you, uh, dear viewer, watching us right now, spent the last week marooned on an island or something like that, good for you. But also, um, I want to get you caught up on our format. So let me walk you through this. 20 Western teams are participating in this tournament and the exciting thing is of course that seven of them are from the EMEA and NA Contender C and they got into this tournament via qualifiers prior to the tournament. Now the teams were split into four groups with five teams each where they play a round robin to determine the top two seeded teams or the top two teams which will then get into a single elimination bracket. Now there is of course also money up for grabs so let's take a look at the prize pool a hundred thousand dollars are split as follows 50k for first place at 20 to second 10 to third and fourth with the top two contenders teams earning 7.5 and 2.5 thousand unless of course they make it into the top four then they wouldn't get the additional money and uh, for those contenders teams outside of the top four we also have tiebreakers in place to determine who will be walking away with the card uh, cold hard cash that's right. So that's what's on the line. And yesterday uh, we had some very exciting uh, matches because we got to see a first look at some of the teams in Group C as well as Group D. And amongst them were the Gladiators and the Toronto Defiant. And now I want to hear it from our analysts. What's your assessment of those two teams, starting with you, Danny? Uh, I'm going to go with Gladiators. I think they look decent. Uh, I, I know that, you know, their first their matchup, it was... They're, I, the first map they were they they looked a little bit shaky. I, I think I would say that's probably because of you know it's the first match jitters and everything. But with all the talks about you know Scrimbucks exchange, how gladiators aren't going to be that good. Like with that mentality coming to mind. But like watching their game, I was actually pretty impressed of everyone uh, you know on the Los Angeles Gladiators roster. And of course, I was actually very impressed of with Papel as well, uh, a player from O2 Blast joining the team. And they look to be good. I think just with time, I think they just need more time to gel as a team. Uh, because like like Dante said in his post match interview, he said you know uh, it only it was it's only been like a week since they all joined uh, the team house. So with time, I think Gladiators, given how talented uh, they are, I think they they are in pretty good shape. All right, Matt, Toronto defined your thoughts now. Yeah, look, I I think Toronto. Uh... They were a bit shaky, but I also think that this is going to be a team that's going to be fine once we start to get into the regular season. I even think kind of deeper into this uh, tournament. Uh, I heard a lot of our, kind of the talk yesterday on like, you know, can Kaluj play all these, you know, different tanks? Uh, I personally think he can. I think he's got enough, I uh, you know, mechanical skill that uh, he'll be able to figure it out with time. And I think they kind of have some, you know, pre-existing synergy with uh, some players on this team. And they also did play against the Houston Outlaws yesterday, where Houston uh, was just a really strong team in general. So I, I think you're going to see better performances from uh, Toronto throughout this event. I also think 
uh, you're going to see them do really well as the season moves on. Uh, I'm actually a you know pretty big fan of the Hydron uh, speedily DPS duo. I think there's a really high ceiling there with those two players. Yeah, and they looked really cohesive yesterday. And uh, a lot of that, of course, thanks to that pre-existing uh, synergy they're having as uh, the majority of the players played with each other in American Tornado previously to uh, joining other respective teams. So I am very excited to see more of both of those teams today to get maybe a better idea of what those new rosters actually uh, can achieve because the sample size so far is small, right? So we can only draw so many conclusions from that. Now, speaking of good things that we want to see, though, we announced our Calling All Heroes programs just a few days ago, actually, which includes the Challenger series as well as the Speaker series. In case you missed that announcement, uh, don't you worry. You can read up on all about Calling All Heroes. All you have to do is head on over to callingallheroes.gg. There you can find out what those programs are, what changes we're making for the 2023 season, and also how you can get involved and support the program. So we hope to see you uh, in our Discord, for example, to uh, join in on all the fun. Now, coming up next, Gladiators start their day against Team Peps and their army of fans, which will be in chat cheering them on. We're going to talk about our predictions and that match right after this break. Welcome back, one and all. We're ready to take a look at our first few Pro-Am matches in just a little bit. But before that, Danny and Matt would like to enrich our lives with some art. All right, are you guys are you guys ready for this? Yeah, okay. So <laughs> since we have a special since we have a special guest on the desk today, we have Matt. I uh -huh. decided to draw Matt here. Guys, look at this. Look at my amazing oh, wow. drawing. 
um, of Matt. And David yep. Topple Goliath. <laughs> Goliath yep. And David Topple Goliath. God, this I is, mean, that is such beautiful. a great drawing. I, I'm such, I'm such an artist. My body would be in so much pain holding up that head with my little <laughs> stick figure self. Uh, but uh, you get it done. What, yeah, what you got for true. us, Matt? Uh, I drew uh, reinforce. So <laughs> somebody in chat said uh, reinforce the other day instead of reinforce. So my imagination went to what would Jonathan look like as kind of a, a human horse, and that's what that I. That would be. A, that would be such a big horse. <laughs> Green horse is a big uh, horse. That is a big horse indeed. And those were some drawings, I guess. Uh, this is my segue into our fan art gallery, which is making a return this season. And if you crave a flexible viewing experience or a way to highlight work from specific tournaments as well as events, well, don't you worry, we got you covered. Also, you can go full CSI on all those gems uh, with an enhanced full-scale view of every piece. So you can look at that arena horse up close. <laughs> I know that's what the people out there want. Now, we can't Damn. wait to see your submissions online or maybe even on our broadcast. So keep them coming. Now, gents, it is time to dig into our first match of the day. Gladiators and Team Peps will face off against each other. We did get a small taste of what these two teams can do yesterday. So let's chat about the starting lineups. Looking at the Gladiators first. Yeah, Gladiators. I mean, we I've been talking about Gladiators this whole pre-show, but I mean, hey, we got... Dante on the lineup. It's the same crew that we saw yesterday. We know what Kefster and Kai could do. I mean, Dante is another great tank for the Gladiators. I think what I want to see more is, I guess, that team synergy that uh, Dante was talking about. And like I said in the pre-show, you know, Dante did say that, you know, it's only been about a week since all the members of the Gladiators joined the team house. So there's, I think that team synergy, that coordination is still a work in progress, but I think with time and maybe in this match, you know, it'll start to shine a little bit more. I think they definitely showed us that a lot of the concerns heading, heading into the season are maybe not warranted. So you can uh, be relieved. You can support the Gladiators. They're not going to let you down. And one way to show support is, of course, by purchasing our support bundles. They're on sale right now. They include not just the three skins you see on display here, but also a really fancy uh, team weapon charm. So make sure to grab them now because the sale goes through until April 11th. So not that much time left. 350 total tokens is what it will cost you and uh, now you're gonna see the opponents of the gladiators they today will face off against team peps matt what are your thoughts uh i, I think they have a uphill battle uh against the gladiators uh today uh we obviously saw team peps play uh a little bit yesterday we know what naga can do right we've seen him uh in the overwatch league in the past uh no kellex as well uh I just don't know if you can like say they're like a favorite in this matchup. I don't be they'll be interesting, like you know, playing those Ryan comps against some of the stuff that the gladiators like to play, and you know, maybe that kind of uh could swing things at moments in uh Pep's favor, but uh definitely going to be pretty difficult for them today. Yeah, it's uh, going to be an uphill battle for sure. So Pep's not coming into this as the favorites. But, you know, we said the same thing last week. And some of those contenders teams really showed up and surprised us. So let's see if the Peps, together with the energy from chat, from their fans, can get it all done. For now, let's take a look at our predictions so we know exactly who we on the desk are supporting for this one. I think the easy pick here, the obvious choice here, has to be Gladiator. It's just on an individual looking at each and every single role gladiator should have the upper hand in every single matchup so i'm all in on them what about you daddy hey you never know i mean they like we were talking about but, gladiators but they didn't look not. perfect right mm -hmm. but they were close so i'm gonna go with the gladiators I was like, it would be kind of funny that Danny speaks about the Gladiators for 99% of the pre-show and then just a little sneaky Team Peps pick here at the end. Uh, I went with the Gladiators as well, which is super surprising. Uh, yeah. no, I, I, I'll pick them for Scott. Uh, that, that'll yeah. be my, my prediction today. I'll take the Gladiators for Custa. That's thank you. That is very kind of you. <laughs> like doing everyone's work and getting paid for yeah. one. What a life. Now, uh, this is day six, of course, of the pro am, and it's about to start. And I want to take this opportunity to remind everyone watching that you are now officially able to engage with the Overwatch League via watch parties on YouTube. So make sure to join your favorite creators as they're bringing you all the live action. Speaking of action, uh, to bring you all of ours are, of course, Leg Day and Lemon Kiwi. Guys, take it away 
Thank you so much. We're so excited for this first match. We'll be covering the first three gladiators. Uh, I mean, like they, we were talking about how they feel like the Avengers of Overwatch. They took all the best pieces of the other rosters, you know, Dante from Houston, Yaki from New York Excelsior, et cetera, and have formed this super team. Although people had a lot to say in the Scrimbucks exchange, which Dante settled <laughs> those rumors. Yeah, Dante said, you know what? Scrims practice is just practice, baby. In the end, it's for results in the lobby that count. And the results did come through yesterday, but it was a touch shaky. We did see a couple of times where old uh, Captain Kevster had to bail out the Avengers team with a well-placed yeah. shield throw here and there. And we're going to be heading over to Nepal, which is where we saw a couple of struggles previously from LA Gladiators. This has been picked by Team Peps. And I think that this leans quite nicely into Crandop's one of Crandop's be best picks, which is the Reinhardt. Crandop's a fantastic Reinhardt player. And obviously over on Shrine and Village, Reinhardt is going to be one of the, uh, the choices du jour for many teams. And Team Pevs, I feel like this should be your team bias right now. A lot of former London Spitfire players, a former Paris Eternal, now known as Vegas Eternal. Um, and Zarion's like kind of the odd duck out of just being a contenders player, but he's also trying out for the World Cup France team in the closed qualifier. Best of luck to him. And Team Peps had an off start, already losing to the Justice. But I'm excited for especially the hybrid versus Kai match matchup on the hit scan. Um, hybrid very much known for his Cassie, along with Kai, who I feel like got the title of top hit scan, or at least top sojourn in the league with Atlanta last season. Yeah, small bit of Team UK rivalry here as well. Hybrid and Kai could likely be considered the best two hit scans in the UK. And as the World Cup starts to take shape, both of these guys are obviously going to be gunning for that spot on the roster. And yeah, I am a little bit nostalgic and fan of Team Peps. Naga was actually <laughs> in the first ever match that I cast professionally playing for Team Singularity back in 2018, an all Danish team. I think Kalex might have been on that as well. Hello, Gladiators. Rolling out now, instead of on the Remarcha that they showed the other day, on Dante's Doomfist. That... I mean, not even Hawk is playing Doomfist. So what is Dante cooking? Of course, like, he was also known for his Doomfist last season with Houston, but Winston, I thought, was his uh, his thing. So for now, I guess Gladiators are just chilling on the point. I think where Dante's set up to close range with the walls, he can get some really good stuns, gets one on the Crandoff. It's going to block. Also, Dodge is asleep, and I think with that out of the picture, Dante could be even more aggressive. Jumps up from behind the DPS of Team Pets, who are missing now their main tank and main healer. And at least he traded out with Dante, so 4v3 for the Glads, but it is cleaned up by Kepster and Kai. Just all the control going over onto Crandop there. Dante hitting the empowered punch, getting a longer stun, and then Babel after that. Or well, Babel, pardon me, for nativized Korean version. <laughs> uh, Babel had managed to hit the sleep onto Crandop as well, meaning that it was an easy burst. Now Crandop is going to be able to uh, mirror the Winston here, and that's going to do a little bit to try and shut down those nades, but already Hybrid and Kalex have been afflicted by Babel. Now, coming through this underside, just to avoid as much focus as possible. The anti-nade, though, from the bell hits. Stops Team Peps from wanting to push in, although Crandop is going to jump in. Anti-heal gone. Zarion pulsed. The one-to-one -one trade, though, was Dante. It's going to chase after Crandop. Points still in favor of the Glads. Dante comfortable to just force Team Peps to come to him and let his DPS do the work, but with Kai missing, have to be up to Kepster and now the sound barrier to finish off with the glad started. There's an enemy here. I'll have a sound barrier there to allow Dante to go a little bit deeper, knowing that they did lose Kepster a touch earlier in that fight. Of course, now Kepster has returned. And this is still anybody's fight, to be honest. There's a good amount of space being controlled by Team Peps, and Crandop still has the nano. Oh, Crandop thinks he gets this kill on the Dante, confirms that. 77% for the Glads. Kepster heading for the hills. Team Pep starting to flip and not seeing Kevster want to stall that out. He's going to go back to the team. Yeah, perhaps a touch too far there from Dante, but also credit to Zerion hitting the flick shot on the sleep there. Absolutely imperative to shutting down the overall tempo of Los Angeles Gladiators' dive and space claim. Now, though, Babel will be able to claim that straight back with a nano boost onto Dante if they so desire. But check out Naga lying in wait up on the top. It's being checked at the moment by Funny Astro. Who Babel is going to want to nano. We've seen even some Cassidy's get it. He's kind of looking at Kai. Might have to be up to Dante to make that space. And he's nano Kai up to him to support the team. But he's got a rival of Kranop. It's 5v4 for the Glads. I think they lost Hybrid so early. Kai burning down this Winston now that 
out of Primal. Got the flip from the Glads at 83%, and Team Peps have to think quick, because they got to recontest. Uh, it's hopefully in the cards. So we're on with a fat nade has earned themselves another nano boost. That's obviously going to be going on to Crandop to keep this point contested if need be. Crandop has taken a wide leap here, and that's going to open a bit of space for hybrid. However, right now suppressed by the Deadeye. He's getting around it, gets slept. And yeah, the nano on the hybrid will guarantee that kill. But Crandop got burned making that space. Team Peps in a 4v3. Funny Astro still has the beat, decides to drop it, hits the three that are left for the Glad. They really believe they can pull this off. And Peps only have a few remaining, getting tossed around by Funny Astro, one of the most aggressive Lucios in the league, and fragged out when his team were down and needed him the most. 100 to 39, a big turnaround from how Nepal went yesterday for the Glads. A beautiful tempo beat as well there by Funny Astro, and it seems that moving away from Matt Ramatra has been a bit of a service for Gladiators. Obviously, they did play a little bit more of the Winston, uh, I believe, on that map shrine yesterday. And uh, Babel has been able to get a lot more usage out of the Ana as well. But I think Funny Astro, they have a critical decision maker. Putting down the sound barrier in the three versus three was very important for allowing the aggressive uh, positions to be capitalized upon and give them a little bit of leeway to not be punished when they may well have been uh, in some very awkward positions afterwards. I think this is why Glad's retained Funny Astro on the roster. Yeah, he only comes in to play Lucio and they've gotten more supports to fill up the other departments, but <laughs> he's a terror on the field and a great beat call to hit the three. Now we go to Sanctum. We got the rush from Crandop and Friends. Of course, no May from Naga. Not the best on Sanctum, especially this pillar side. It's a little odd. Dante has always preferred the Ram over the Rhine, so I'm excited for this matchup. Yeah, one of the things here about the Reinhardt you've got to know. Oh, uh, you got to know Kai's accuracy, but you got to know as well that the Reinhardt rotations, as well as the Ramata rotations, very inefficient. So you have to maneuver around that central death pit. I mean, they can't take direct fights most of the time. Yeah, Cranop decided to go for the corner, thought the health pack would help, and then he got anteed and slept, and just extra damage went in, when I feel like Cranop could have just went back towards the mega side where the rest of his team were, but only a couple of kills as the Glads would be able to hold this choke. Guy once again playing the off angle here. It's going to be difficult to dislodge him, but Dante is also making sure that Crandop has very little space to work. It's a risky place to be against the Lucia, mind. Naka? Someone is flipping the point down below. Peps should be free to do that. Peps now and go back to the Everyone leaves. Yeah, everyone <laughs> just leaves. Yeah, Gladiator's is like, oh, we lost two. Uh, we're just going to call that one. Overall, uh, a solid disengage call, but here's Naga going absolutely legolas mode. Oh, good catch, Kevster. Sonic Arrow, <laughs> right to the dome. And Naga's proving that uh, maybe he should be back in Overwatch League. Obviously, his time on the Paris Eternal, and who are now Vakes Eternal, was a little bit ignominious, but is definitely an incredibly talented player. His May in particular is fantastic, and I imagine we're going to see that uh, later on in this series if Team Peps continue to play the right. Darion's in trouble. He got anti immortality's out. He's trying to play off the Ant Matrix, and Kepster a menace in the back. Great pulse, very limited heals, and these dominoes are just going to crumble for Team Peps. Crandop is just trying to extend what little Team Peps have. Although it is a lead, I expect that to be flipped over in the Glads farming as much as they can in terms of ult charge, and they get the point right back. You cannot get a more valuable stick than Honor Baptiste, who has his window up, but no immortality field to put down. Absolute masterclass from Kevster on target priority and on how to approach those engages to a Baptiste. Really good forcing early on. Now with a Sonic Arrow here, absolutely makes mincemeat of hybrid. Kai is so gross, and if, if Team Peps want to come in out of this door, you could see the Dragon Strike to isolate some members, and even Cranop was out that door, but Kai wants to see if he can actually get kills out of it. And especially if Team Peps aren't wanting to fight, you can just extend the lead that you have now for the Glads. Giving up that space, though, is an interesting call when you have that Dragon Strike going back to the pillars, taking advantage of the distance. There's a Deadeye from Hybrid. Just to zone, zone people away. The Dragon Strike from Kai comes late. Now a responding Dragon from Kai. Team Peps have laid the red carpet all the way to the point and flip it essentially with maybe one or two kills. 
Yeah, managed to speed over there, actually catch up on the Asher on the point, I believe. And then overwhelming four versus one. Babel is in a very risky position. This is likely going to be a hostage situation. We can be staggered out by Team Pep, so we need to make sure not to give away too much space. And of course, Kevster here is going to be doing kind of a rear guard action to help the disengage of Babel. Got a nano Kevster, everybody run! It's the thing of nightmares, but the sound beer from Kellex just makes it so Kevster's shop is exhaustingly long. Immortality in place from Zerion too, but Team Peps, they kind of just negated this nano Kevster and just shot everybody else, and then Dante just fell off the map or reset with the team. So last fight for Team Peps to force round three. Overall, pretty strong choice from Kalex to try and uh, exploit that early advantage using the sound barrier, getting rid of the threat from Kevster. And now you've got to try and move on to a point. Kevster's likely going to be the one to touch, but Crandall can get the instant slam. A second but Annihilation is popped. Ooh, and you're going to drop Dante off at daycare. But it's 4 2 3. Glad down that they have their supports. Kai has a big old shield in his way. Someone has to touch. Funny Astro is there. Crandop is anteed. It's a 2v2 on the point. Crandop. Taking advantage of the corner. Kalex in a 1v2 surely can't really pull this off, but he is stalling for as long as he can. Flip for the Glads. Team Peps will reset as a team. This is forced Dante though onto the Doomfist now. Not his idealized hero for this point, but still you can do some cheesy environments or knock off Sandra a good battler when it comes to the point itself. Still, the question is, how do you stop Team Peps from getting onto the point? Crandop himself has moved over to the Orissa. The huge amount of control that the Orissa offers is going to be excellent for shutting Dante down and being a huge, unbelievably hard to remove anchor on the point. For now, we'll just try to anchor that point, like you said. Getting the flip. This has begun, Anti out from Babel. Gladiators have the weight on their shoulders to go contest this to see if they can make this a flawless Nepal, but so far, Team Peps have a dragon to deal with. We're, we'll clear out that point. Dante was able to carve through that pillar side. Hybrid over on pillars, though, with the dead eye. See if he can find Buddy Astro or Kevster. They hide in closet, they avoid, but they step off the point, so Team Peps will force the round three. Ah, oh, Crandop ended up dying there because he has to use so many of his cooldowns to actually wrestle control of the point away. But it was part of a longer plan from Team Peps to get control of the point, start Los Angeles Gladiators having to continuously move in and out of the point super quickly because the overtime week was starting to go down increasingly fast and then zoning them away at the best moment with the Deadeye. An excellent battle plan from Team Peps and Los Angeles Gladiators were sent reeling. Oh, what a boop. Great stuff from Kellex. <laughs> to stop the touch. Then he had the dead eye to deal with. I think Dante losing control of pillars while he was on Doomfist. I mean, wasn't a great matchup for him having to deal with an Orisa. I always swapped Orisa when I have an annoying Doom player on my ranked teams. The Javelin. Such a kryptonite to that. But we go back to the Rhine versus Ram here on Village. This is where the Gladiators dominated yesterday, it felt like. Let's see, it's a high ground. Control for Team Peps. Funny Astro looking for any boobs. Unsuccessful. Maywall behind the Glads. Dante taking so much pressure. Kevster thinks that's a distraction to find his way to the back line. And killing Zerion is a big, big accomplishment. Taking away those heals. Although you thought Team Peps had the jump. Gladiators struck even harder. They go to the point just to deal with these last few members. And that'll be the Glads with the point first. In this fight, Lemon, we saw both of the critical points about how these compositions are going to interact. And that's Kevster trying to kill Zerion successfully, and then uh, Naga trying to kill Kevster. It's a battle of the Scandinavians here, because Naga on the May can one-tap Kevster. 150 HP, Icicle to the Bonds, ain't surviving that. However, without a Tracer of their own, it means that Naga is going to have to be Team Pep's sort of designated Tracer repellent to keep Zerion safe. And if Naga moves too far away, Zerion's going to be incredibly exposed. Oh, Kevster, I guess, got exposed, <laughs> too. Uh, so Glads will have that flank pressure. We'll have to fight from front to back. Immortality out of the way, and Kai couldn't jump and avoid hybrid. Gets a 2k, and that's a flip for Team Peps, and 3k in that fight will help the ult charge for sure. And here, one of the things that's going to be super important is going to be that Blizzard. You can try and shut down Dante's Annihilation with the Blizzard, because if you could freeze him up and simply stick Crandop in front of him with a shield, you can block off uh, the tendrils that come from that Annihilation and instantly cancel the ult as it ticks down from three seconds to zero in, uh, in real time. We'll see if Naga wants to do that, but also remember the wall can be used to mess with Dante's ult as well, so it needs to be super judicious with when this is popped. 
and Naga's so close to the Blizzard too, and Dante snuck up on him. Team Pets trying to play off that wall and that Blizzard as their win condition. They step actually outside of the point. Blizzard right in their face. The sound barrier too, but the Annihilation plus the Nano of the Gladiators is too much to handle. Along with Kester's Pulse Bomb, that gets also a shiny gold sticker. Uh, Glad's back in control. Yeah, good read there from Dante as well to W forward using the Annihilation speed boost you get from the Nemesis form when the Blizzard was uh, actually thrown out in the first place. Now I'll get through it a little bit too deep, and so Dante couldn't be fully frozen and then was able to quickly find that backline and expose them with the pummels. Dead Eye being used as a commuting tool here by Hyper. This is super important. You reduce the pressure your Ryan takes on the approach, and then you can get on top of people like the Bell. Trying to see that angle where Team Peps want to jump down. I guess they're going to play this front to back off the Ant Matrix of Zarion. Forcing the flip. Glads don't have a great contest tool besides Kepster is more busy trying to kill support, but Grandop wins the tank battle. And you don't all have that flank presence from Gladiators, at least not in time. As Dante couldn't get healed, and Funny Asher wasn't there with the barrier in time, so Dante goes to Doomfist. Okay, the Doomfist is going to be a little bit better for trying to mess with these overall formations. Trying to knock an isolated Squish off the high ground, perhaps. As Dante is going to be uh, pressuring the... Oh, that's a bad ice block! That means that Nagra has to move in vulnerable. Sound barrier from Funny Astro doesn't hit as many members as he would have hoped. This Team Pep trying to bunker down, but they're getting pep pummeled by so many angles and losing Zarion early has been such a crutch for Team Peps. Uh, just not having the amount of heals against Babel and others is rough as Glads take their angles and they won the fight. Oh man, I, I hate to boil it all down to one thing, but if Nagra managed to get that ice lock on the point, then Team Peps definitely could have played that a lot more slowly and had a lot more consideration from the, for the resources and cooldowns that Gladiators had available. Now Kevster, speaking of a resource, the Pulse Bomb, good to go may well see a repeat of trying to force out Zerion's immortality field early with a well-placed clip and then finishing him off. Custer, so close to killing Hybrid there. Pulse sticks! Immortality taken care of too. Crandop slept and Team Peps had ults. They had win conditions, but couldn't make up their minds in time. Glads overtime about to go away. Round three in their hands and Glads will take map one. Made to sweat and made to try, but in the end, it was a, a curious pick in the flex support versus flex support. But Bell picking up Zerion super early and also a really early force of that immortality field. It feels like Anna right now was in a fantastic position to try and uh, manhandle the Baptiste by forcing out the ammo early, using pressure tools like the Anti-Nade. But I am pretty enthused here by what we've seen from Team Peps. If they can take us to a more rush-centric map where they can where they can consistently find these May Ryan fights like King's Row, Gladiators might not have an easy time of it. It's, they make it look easy, at least. I think Team Peps need to be more proactive with these fights. I think if you let Kevster have the time to get set up behind you, and you let Dante uh, push from the front, Gladiators, their pinch is deadly, and I don't think Crandop and friends can just sit idly by. And that's where I liked maybe that proactivity of Naga throwing in the Blizzard outside of the point, instead of letting Gladiators come to them. Because I think if they just sit and wait, especially on a map like Village, or a map like, like Shrine, that we saw, that's where Gladiators surrounded them. They divided and they conquered. Naga, I think, had a really strong showing against Kai on the Hanzo, although it just really came down to uh, power positions on the map, namely that Pillar's side. And Dante kind of floating between Ram and Doomfist has been an interesting look to try and counter swap against Peps. Indeed, it has been. Like Dante, we know, has a pretty wide hero pool as a, as a fresh tank player. To be honest, there are two players who were former Overwatch League DPS, who were no longer playing DPS on the Gladiators. One's Babel, who used to play, I believe, uh, Widowmaker and, and similar heroes for 2020 iteration of, uh, of London Spitfire. Krillin also came from that roster, and then went back to contenders in Korea, went on to O2 Blast, became a flex support, became a particularly deadly flex support with O2 Blast run playing the Kiriko. And uh, the same for Dante, of course. It went from being a DPS player from Houston Outlaws to being their de facto tank and then being poached by Gladiators. He did so well last time. <laughs> yeah. Well, Gladiators are also doing so well right now. They've taken map number one and they're on match point. After this break, you'll find out if Team Pep still got the pep in their stat.
Oh, oh flooding out. That is the delay tactics widely killed. And it will be five. Oh, not quite so much anymore. Kempster dishing out the damage. Well, this is giving me vibes of Florida against the Atlanta Rain. <laughs> oh, 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 what that is dirty? A rough return here. Oh, wow. Just kind of getting bullied. Oh, yeah, that is it. <laughs> Wave hello, maybe you could buy to the rest of your team, Decay, because Lastro's on the field. Nano Zen just to keep him alive. Rolling, trying to keep everybody alive. And I tried, oh boy. Punched into oncoming traffic. Dante shuts him down. Well, that hype video is next level. I, and you got to see the Dante Doomfist at the very end. We have some news to break. Well, I guess not us. But Twitter be popping these days. Take a look at, at this. Yeah, Sean Miller Showing breaking the news. Uh, that we, we do not have to due to severe weather conditions at their facility. Today's matches featuring Red Wedding Sports have been postponed. Uh, the desk will have a longer breakdown on what's going to be happening instead later on. So uh, Lemon and I can focus on this match. And, well, we had a good look at that hype video coming through from the LA Gladiators. And, well, they showed quite a few players there. So why don't we also get to expand the number yeah. of Gladiators players that we get to see? We've got ourselves a quick substitution. Lemon looks like we're swapping over to a double flag. We have to focus on people who can play Overwatch. And you know somebody <laughs> who I was a real big fan of? Maybe it was Cope. But every time I watched New York Excelsior play last season, I looked at Yaki, and he's he's a game changer on his tracer. He's the one pop-off player on New York Excelsior last year that I that would make my preds shake. Uh, so Yaki's coming in instead of Kai. And you have Lastro making an appearance. We saw uh, yesterday he played a map, I believe, Blizzard World, where they ran the Ana Kiriko. Now the Kepster Yaki DPS duo line is really interesting. I really dig the Anakiriko. I don't know if we're going to see Anakiriko here on uh, King's Row. It likely would be very good for the first point defense because it means that Ana basically never has to drop away from the high ground of appeal that the Kiriko can give can be very sufficient with her teleportation and her swift step. However, we did see a couple of hiccups from the Los Angeles Gladiators going up against the Team Peps Rush. And, well, Team Peps are a Europe team. And uh, speaking as a, as a proud Brexit boy myself, uh, <laughs> Europe loves its Rhine. We, we, we like the big hammer man with the shield. We were, we were born with the Rhine, molded by the Rhine. The legendary Rhines of old, Coco, Fraggy, LH Cloudy, they were all forged in the crucible of European ranked. And Los Angeles Gladiators, they're going to be—they're going to need to be ready to rebuff that kind of a, approach, unless Crandall actually plays for Diva and makes me waste all my breath. <laughs> Well, they need a different game plan, whatever it is. Team Peps actually played and chose King's Row yesterday against the Washington Justice, where they started off on defense, gave up a three-minute time bank uh, to the Justice, and then lost that map, and that was the 0-2 or 2-0 loss in that case. But start off with some Ryan Rush, May Cassidy for them, the Lucio Bap, and then when they couldn't get to point B after several attempts on their attack, they swapped kind of this Tracer Cassidy dive with Lucio Ana. So Team Peps aren't afraid to change up their strategy, although kind of the trend with contender teams is they stick to what they know and what they're best at. I do like a little bit of a faster look, though, from Crandall being able to try and get on top of Lastro and disrupt the healing that Gladiators are going to be able to push in to Dante, who's going to have plenty of healing coming his way between both the Kiriko and the Ana. At the moment, though, it's just going to be a slight exchange of poking as both teams will jostle for positions. And I think we might see Kalex and Naga wrapping around the outside to try and dislodge the bell. Team Peps on the approach. And yeah, these anti-nades from Lastro. That's why you play this backside. You have a great angle to lob these over and then jump on them afterwards. But losing Babella is not the intended start. Lasher has to use the nade on themselves too. Gladiators in not so healthy position. And Dante has to fall back just to protect their supports. Meanwhile, I'd love to see Naga put pressure on this point. At least if you're getting these initial kills, it would be great to have a tick out of it. Naga doesn't know where his supports are. Gets headshot by Kevster. Couldn't go there alone. And I feel like Peps really blew a good opportunity. Yes, everyone's getting suppressed so hard at the moment by Kev's Yaki and Lashro just sending in those constant snipes around this choke point. You can see that that Sonic Arrow is consistently pinging Hybrid and Zerion's location. And now the opening that Babel was slaying opened has been closed once more. 
trouble in the way. Hybrid can also take control of Hotel, but really a lot of Gladiators are sat up, sat up on this high ground. But Bell again the first to fall, but this happened last time and Gladiators weren't too worried. They sit on the high ground, they have Dante anchor the point, and he's gonna do more than just that. He's just got nano by Lastro. Not seeing a lot of damage being taken by Peps. Really, their supports are zoned off. Yaki gets involved and Team Peps are getting dismantled. Huge move by Kellex. That move actually forced a primal rage to try and get the reset. And Dante is by no means home free here. Can disengage, but I've got to say it, Lemon. Babel cannot be picked in the same location again. His disengagement game is bloody weak. Twice in the same place. You can teleport. You need to be more judicious with when you can take those duels and when you cannot. It's very different than playing with a Lucio that can kind of boob or at least escort you out of danger. While it's connecting with your Ana, it's a little bit more difficult. But Bell at least picks off Hybrid. 4v3 for Team Peps. Trying to take control of Hotel so that they're safe from the dive. And Zerion was just left all by themselves. And, you know, no Primal, no, no Nano came out. Team Peps just have a really hard time taking the initiative and getting something out of it. But Bill's timing much better right there. I think actually joining Yaki in a dive to try and pressure out Zerion once they essentially had him pinned into that hotel. However, Team Peps coming up on five ultimates. Surely we can grug up, press all the Qs and take this point. But to rebuff them, if up dives too deep, I would expect to see a Kitsune rush from Babel to in, uh, enjoy that extra DPS to burn him down. Last fight. Only two limbs recorded by Team Peps. Hopefully you can get a few more. Nano Winston going after Kepster, just climbing up the wall. The bell, Suzu Yu's, leaves behind the Kitsune Rush, teleports out, and this is why chasing a Kiriko is kind of tough, as I guess Cranop's gonna go see what the rest of the map is like, because I don't know if they're gonna get to see it like that. There's 34 seconds left. And Gladius actually made a critical choice in that fight as well, Lemon. And that's having Lastro play in a different window compared to where he was going previously. That meant that Crandop, when he dove in, he was instantly evaded by a wall climb and leap from Kevster, whereas if it was an Anna, the Crandop. ability to leap would be much harder. Ah, uh, Primal, please? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> when his team has to go, the initiative is taken. Crandop's been slept. Lastro's 1 HP. Left behind a Nano for Yaki. Kevster's Dragon cutting off Team Pets, who are running out of ultimates, running out of lives and you need to do more than just two ticks but the momentum is there yaki behind harassing hybrid tough matchup against the Cassidy. dante is gonna finish it off though even trades presence on the point by team pep they have close spawns but they only have two people left so it's gonna be up to naga to put the hero cape on and yaki will give him the good old backhand and team peps will not be able to unlock that payload yeah, the hero cape was supposed to be donned, but the gladiator said, baby, we're the Avengers. You don't get to hero with us, Team Peps. Well, it's not lost, Lemon, but it is going to be bloody hard to win. An ironclad defense is going to be required here. And honestly, I, I think that Team Peps did have the right idea here of playing a more vertical composition. Like, if you're playing the Reinhardt, it could be so hard to try and dislodge Lastro from one of those positions. I don't know what they could have done better to potentially remove Lastro. Maybe you play a Sombra instead so you can try and run a 50-50 pincer dive by having the Sombra set up and then have um, Crandop move in afterwards or like engage with the Leap while the Sombra uncloaks. But in many of these cases, it really seems like Lastro is only being attacked by Crandop and you, you yeah. know Lastro. He's he's gonna hit those sleeps. He's gonna hit those nades. And Yaki has recorded zero deaths in that first round. And then the prediction on that recall is disgusting. Yaki just got subbed in. First time seeing him out. And he's doing work. Doing the Lord's work back here. And it's just no wonder Team Pets can't get a dive going with this guy back here. Yeah, Yaki's being an absolute terror. Start off, uh, it's an old tradition, of course, for the LA Gladiators to stick a Widowmaker up on here. This was the site of the Great Bamboozle, and that was LA Gladiators, I believe, sure for who made that one work. So why not have a cheeky peeky here, see if anyone from Team Peps wants to try their luck against the old Kevster Roulette. And also, the synergy with the Sonic Arrow is not to be understated as well. And even in the worst of cases, with the new changes for Overwatch 2, you can turn it into charge for your next ultimate, like Deadeye, in this case. Now, 
Oh, actually, that's a early lead. I, here what I really Dante. like too is that Yaki is playing Tracer and Kepster's on the hit scan, kind of truly proving that Kepster is like this flex god. If you can have your maybe number one Tracer out there, or if you need more options, Yaki can come in and kind of let Kepster play other things. So we're seeing so many different looks from the Gladiators, and Dante talked about that pressure of being so flexible. And man, this fight looks so easy, and this is how a dive is done, everybody. You go, and you do not hesitate. And look, they're not even letting them respawn. Look at Yaki Kevster run back there. Team Pevs ain't got much left to say. And in this best of three, the Gladiators take a swift and pretty ugly 2-0. <laughs> and like you said, like that dive was executed a lot better. I loved the early jump from Dante onto that first piece of high ground because that was all about buying space for Babel to try and play the off angle with the Kiriko. The crosshair placement was amazing. Headshots came through and that made people so much easier to chunk down with a second phase of the dive coming through from the long range hit scan that we saw from Kevster. As she pointed out, this could be the year with Yaki on the team where Kevster really gets to show how flexible he is and he's not just a tracer god. Yeah, that was a good warm-up for Glads, because I feel like they got the final boss coming up of the Boston Uprising. And of course, the desk will talk about the Redbird esports situation. Um, but a double header today with not that match in between means Glads got to Got to bring that momentum, and sh they sure looked good today. I know everyone was saying that the shakiness was evident yesterday, but I think they're back on top. And now that they have all their players in their facility with enough time to be together, it's glad to see Glads. I'm glad to see Glads back on top. But also, player of the match, someone who really stood out today. Your player of the match is Babel. What a pickup Babel was. Like we said, assembling the Avengers from so many different teams. Babel came from O2 Blast, the academy team of the San Francisco Shock. It was an absolute menace over in Korean contenders. And this was actually such an important pick that we highlighted towards the end of Nepal. Grabbing Zerion that early. Babel's sense of timing, especially in conjunction with Dante and Yaki, has been sublime in order to try and. Uh, create some openings, even though we did see uh, a couple of maybe too egotistical lack of TPs at the beginning of King's Row, the rest of the team make uh, make hay while the sun shines. And the sun shines because Babel opened up so many of those early fights with well-placed headshots that meant it was hard to recover from the amount of damage that was being done. Yeah, I think the Ana was a huge diff in that first map of the amount of times he's able to nano Dante to make that space. And then those anti-nades and kind of that was the go sign for a lot of their fights. Then when it came to King's Row, like, yeah, he maybe had the most amount of deaths on that one. But I think once he figured out the timing on his teleports, he also wasted a lot of Cranop's time. And that's how Cranop found himself in Narnia on King's Row. It kind of messed up a lot of the tempo that Team Peps had there. Um, but speaking of tempo, like I said, Glads have another match coming up. We're going to hear from the desk uh, during an extended break. So Glads have time to have their snackies and whatnot. And hopefully I have enough to break down because Glads made this pretty swift. So we will see you all on the other side of this break.
Welcome to the Watchpoint Game Break. Uh, we're going to start this one off with a quick announcement. Uh, Lemon Kiwi and Leg, they already alluded to it, that we have some changes in our schedule. So let's pull up the tweet from Sean Miller to see exactly what is happening. He writes that due to severe weather at the facility of, uh, that is of course, Redbird Esports, today's matches featuring Redbird Esports have been postponed. The health and safety of players is the highest priority. Grateful uh, the organization has taken appropriate steps to help ensure their safety. As a result, we're working with Redbird and their opponents to identify appropriate times to reschedule these matches and we'll share these updates with the community as soon as we have them. Today, we will have an abridged schedule that will still feature three matches. Beginning with the Gladiators versus Team Peps, which is what we just got to watch, followed by the Uprising versus the Gladiators, and concluding with Wisp versus the Uprising. We thank all the teams and players today for their flexibility and consideration. Thank you so much, Sean, for the update. So there you have it. Of course, we hope that everyone is staying safe in the region uh, over where Redbird sure. Esports is currently located, and we hope to see them on the servers very soon. For now, however, Let's break down the match we just got to saw yesterday. We talked about gladiators, you know, not looking as dominant as we really wanted them to, but today a different kind of gladiators. You definitely can tell that they were, you know, they were in it. They, they were they were they were good luck for the gladiators. Matt, what was that face? Matt's just like uh, no, they were they were, they were, they were <laughs> yeah. cut ahead. I think it's safe to say, yeah. right? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they they looked really good. I I don't think uh really kind of like any of these teams you'll see you know from even the overwatch league side are really in final form for what we'll see in the season uh but we saw really nice things uh from you know the dps line which i think is to be expected all season long right with uh kebster kai and yaki uh i, I think those three players are just fantastic uh it's just kind of how do you make the rest of the team work um which dante you know switching over playing that tank role now full time uh, he has the mechanical skill, obviously, to play all the tanks. It's just uh, you know, that that kind of like in-game awareness knowledge. Like, can he pick it up fast? I, I believe he can. Yeah, I mean, he talked about that yesterday in our interview as well, right, Danny? Yeah, I mean, he was saying that, you know, he was feeling a bit stressed because he had to pick up so many different heroes, but I think he's doing a fantastic job. And like what Matt, Matt said about the DPS lineup, I really like it. I think this was our first time seeing Yaki, right? And I think he absolutely popped off. And I think Lemon, uh, Lemon Kiwi and Leg, they highlighted it pretty well how, you know, having so much talent on the DPS lineup, like allows them to have so much more flexibility. We all know that Kevster is a great tracer, but Yaki is also a great tracer, which means that either of the two could flex onto a different hero and just, you know, go crazy as well. So I think Gladiators, they're, you know, I think they're becoming more and more interesting as more matches are being played, definitely. Yeah, let's take a look at some of the numbers from Yaki. That's very dramatic. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so Zero here is death. Yaki as Tracer Unkillable. in this very match. Zero deaths, just unkillable. A uh, very slippery little Tracer right there. He's been a standout player pretty much right. every season in one point of time. Uh, he's been, this is, what is that? His third? His third year in the Overwatch third League, year, right? Yeah. yeah, so he oh. started with the Florida Mayhem, moved over to the New York Excelsior, and he's now playing here, for sure. the Gladiators. I mean, it's, I mean, the stat card just shows like how, how talented he is. I think, and even last season, from what I remember, you know, on NYXL, the, you know, the team didn't have that much success. But Yaki, just as a player, I think he still stood out to me uh, when he was in NYXL. So just being on this roster with Kefster and Kai, it's just kind of crazy. Well, I, the skill has never been the question with Yaki. It's like, can he play in a winning formula, like set with a team, right? Uh, you know, New York last year, uh, oftentimes he was just kind of like, you think uh, it's 
like somebody in your ranked games, you know, blasting the music going <laughs> off in their own, own lane and just trying to just kill backlines, which can work against some teams, but can't against others. Uh, so it's like, how, can you actually kind of work him in as a player who can play in like a winning system? Like, I think it's still kind of uh, up for debate, but the, the thing that you can't debate with Yaki is just his individual skill on every single hero. I mean, the guy is just unbelievable. Absolutely, and uh, we are looking at the other side here for a second as well, Team Peps. They managed to sneak around uh, from Nepal uh, off of their hands from the Gladiator. So let's take a look at um, Sanctum and see how they got it done. I mean, I think this was, for me, it was really close, but it was, of course, uh, Team Peps, you know, getting the better, uh, of course, getting the win at the end. And they looked a lot better. I think I was very impressed about, as we're seeing right now, Naga's Hanzo, I think, was a clutch play. I think he sort of played a big part in Peps winning this team fight and also the winning the round as well. Yeah, we saw them play some Arisa as well, uh, which yeah. is quite interesting, uh, you know, from Team Peps. But I think this is the type of uh, thing I think we talked a bit about it in the pregame. It's like if they were going to win, you thought it would be in these like rush brawly style comps, right? Uh, then that's kind of what they took advantage of there. Yeah, it's actually the first time we've seen Orisa so far in this tournament as well. Uh, maybe that's just like to, you know, se secure some some point presence or whatever it might be. Uh, it's definitely interesting to see Orisa uh, being played in the mix there as well. Now, we do have an interview ready uh, for you all, and this one is going to be with Bubble. So, Danny, take it away. All right, thank you so much, Zoe. And we have the player of the match. We have Bubble joining for the post-match interview. Bubble 선수, 들리시나요? 안녕하세요. 아, 네, 안녕하세요. Right, Babel says hi. All right, and he says thank. Oh, and thankfully he could hear me very well, loud and clear. All right, awesome. Let's uh, let's jump right into the interview. So, Babel, uh, I think the last time we saw you on in the Overwatch League was when you were a DPS player and you were playing for the London Spitfire. And you know, time passed and you're coming back to the league and now you're a support player. So how did that how did that role change happen? So, 일단 첫 번째 질문으로 바벨 선수 제 기억으로 마지막으로 저희가 리그에서 바벨 선수를 봤었을 때가 어 딜러였던 거로 제가 기억을 하는데 이제 좀 시간이 지나고 다시 이제 다시 리그로 돌아오면서 어 이제 역할이 좀 바뀌었죠. 이번 힐러로 어, 들어오시게 되셨는데 이 역할이 어떻게 변환이 되셨나요? 아, 그그 그 주변에서 서브일을 해보는 거 어떠냐고 권유하기도 했고 특히 전에 있던 오토블라스트 팀 감독님이랑 코치들이 서브일러로 와주면 정말 좋을 것 같다 해서 고민하다가 하게 됐어요. Right, it was pretty simple. I think uh, you know people around me, those the, my peers around me, told me sort of suggested uh, that like I play flex support. They were asking me or uh, giving me advice. They were telling me that you know why don't you try try out playing uh, flex support. And not only that, uh, you know our coaches and head coach of the O2 uh, O2 Blast, my previous team, they told me that you know we'll be really grateful uh, if you could jump on that flex support role to help out the team. So that's how we made. Uh, the change. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly follow up on that. I mean, you did make the change because of your peers and I guess of the because of the O2 coaches. But how are you? Do you like playing support more or do you feel like DPS is more of your role? 자 방금 그 어떻게 보면은 이제 힐러로 넘어오게 된 계기를 말씀해 주셨는데 그냥 개인적인 바벨 선수의 생각을 좀 듣고 싶으세요. 아 듣고 싶어요. 바벨 선수가 보셨을 때는 솔직히 말해서 좀 이게 힐러가 더 맞는 포지션인 것 같은지 아니면 딜러가 좀더 맞는 것 같은지 아니면 둘다 재밌던지. 어떠, 어떠신 것 같습니까? 아 딜러도 재밌긴 한데 이 서브 딜러라는 포지션이 상대를 때리는 것도 할수 있어서 약간 딜러의 재미를 같이 느낄 수 있, 있어서 좋은 것 같아요. Yeah. I mean, DPS, playing DPS is really fun, but I mean, uh, playing sub flex support is it has the it has its own color and it's really unique that you know you could heal your teammates. Not only that, you could also deal damage. You could sort of get that uh, DPS vibe from the from the flex support as well. So I'm actually enjoying playing uh, flex support for the gladiators. All right. Uh, I mean, my next question I do want to ask because. 
the Gladiators, current Gladiators teams, I feel like, are filled with veterans. Everyone that has been playing the league last season. Uh, and of course, uh, big names are joining the team as well. As someone that are, is coming from O2 Blast, do you feel it? Do you feel more pressured to sort of perform uh, with given how uh, many veterans are in your roster? 자, 두 번째 질문은 바벨 선수를 제외하고 나서 어, 아무래도 이제 다른 팀원들은 다 저번 시즌에서도 좀 이렇게 쟁쟁한 선수들, 그 이름을 날렸던 선수들이 많기 때문에 이번 현 글래디, 글래디 로스 어, 오투 블레스트 티어 2 어떻게 보면 컨텐더스에서 넘어온 선수가 바벨 선수 뿐이기 때문에 조금 더 부담감이나 좀 이런 거를 경기 도중이나 아니면 뭐, 뭐 스크림을 할때좀 이럴 때좀 느끼시나요? 어, 한국에서 스크림 할 때는 처음에 좀 느꼈던 것 같은데 미국 와서 스크림 하면서 아예 그런 생각 없어지고 잘 연습했던 것 같아요. Right, definitely when I was screaming from Korea before I came to the US, I definitely felt those burdens. Uh, it, it was, it did, I definitely felt that. But as soon as I landed in LA, when I came to America and, and you know, when I was in person practicing with my teammates, uh, it got a lot better. And right now, I don't feel as burdened as much as I did when I was in Korea. All right, Babel, that is it for the interview. Thank you so much for your time. And again, big congratulations on the win and good luck in your next match. 자, 어, 승리 축하 드리면서 다음 경기도 화이팅 하시는 걸 바라면서 인터뷰 마치도록 하겠습니다. 감사합니다. 아, 감사합니다. 땡큐. Thank you so much, Bobel, and of course, uh, good luck in the next match, which is about to happen very soon, as uh, they are getting ready. As I said uh, prior to the interview, we have some schedule changes, so our next match will be Gladiators and the Boston Uprising. Now, as you can see on your screen, that's right, these are our revamped 2023 team jerseys. On your screen right now is, of course, the Gladiators one, and you too can have one of those. So make sure to head on over to our store to take a look at your favorite team Pro Kid jerseys for the 2023 season. Now, uh, I think it's really interesting to hear uh, Danny from him about that change in role because, quite frankly, I do think that it actually adds a lot of good things. Uh, to a team if a player transitions from one role to another. I feel like a tank who previously played DPS or a support who previously DPS, they kind of approach that role differently. I mean, I definitely feel so. And we could we could kind of see from how Babel plays, because when I see Babel play, I don't know, for Ana or especially Kiriko as well, he's pretty aggressive. And like he said in the interview, you know, you get the best of both worlds. While you heal and support your teammates, you could also sort of get those kills and sort of be a uh, semi DPS when you're playing for like that is like please don't uh, please yeah, don't look, 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 <laughs> what 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 Babel is trying to say is that they asked him to play flex support he reluctantly said okay fine <laughs> And now he's trying to find the positives of it, which are being able to do some of the things he was still doing playing damage. Uh, but the fact that he's on a team and he start, you know, playing well and playing a lot on flex support, he's not going to come out and be like, oh, I just want to be a DPS again. Of course, he's going to be like, yeah, yeah, flex support. Yeah, it's great. I love this. Uh, you know, <laughs> keep it going. Let him have it, Matt. We're hey. To, we're trying to well, hype him up there. I don't know. Wait, wait. He could Look, he could have been honest and be like, hey, hey, no. flex is fun, but hey, I, I kind of like DPS. That's not going to hurt when, him. When you even flex Q in like the game and you play DPS and support, really, you're only doing support because you're like, oh, well, I can get into a game fast. It's kind of like the same thing. It's like, <laughs> oh, well, you know, teams are looking for support, so I can, I can well, get on. And, you know, he probably was like, oh, man, uh, hey, somebody actually wants me as a support. All right, fine. I'll give this a shot. It's a shot. Well, he's, he's looking pretty great. good. Yeah, he's looking pretty good in the shot he's given it. And quite frankly, if you can play support like you can play your DPS uh, and just look deadly, why not? You know, definitely going to benefit your team. Yeah. Let's see if he can get it uh, or, or keep on, keep on. I don't know where I was supposed keep to go with it. Keep on going. Did that <laughs> one. Keep let's on take that. Going. Yeah, let's keep on going in their next <laughs> match. This is about to happen very soon. But first, we're going to head into a quick break. We're going to see you on the other side.
welcome back! Ah, penguins. What a sight for sore eyes. <laughs> uh, another great sight for sore eyes is, of course, some merch. That's right, because you can get your hand on our Overwatch League Pro-Am event jerseys. That's right, and they are limited uh, to get. They're only available until the end of, Pro, uh, of the Pro-Am tournament. So grab yours now in your shop, in our shop, actually. Uh, your shop. Um, your shop Matt, is our shop. My shop. We're all, uh, we all are one shop. <laughs> uh, this is fantastic. I don't know. There's something about having Matt on the desk which just throws me off my game just yeah. by his presence. I was going to say. It's just like it, some it, chaos radiating from, from you. I was going to say it's a long day, but like in actuality, it's become a way shorter day if you see the schedule here on the screen. <laughs> and yet spending time with you feels like forever, Matt. That's uh, true. Not sure. Like twice insults as long. are compliments. Either way, I'm pretty excited uh, to head into this next match, uh, and because we're gonna finally see Boston Uprising playing. We've been talking about that um, roster quite a bit now. They are a star-studded lineup. I mean, looking at those legends, oh. wow. Oh man, where do we? Where do I even start? Where do we even start? Ugh. Okay, Smurf on the tank was a crazy great tank player from Soul Dynasty. Bird Ring, we heard from him from the pre-show. Decay, another crazy tracer player, and of course these are gone and Twilight, both oh, just great. I this is another just like it's like it's <laughs> Danny like Houston, even, okay. but with blue. It's like Houston, but in blue color. And like, what does that even mean, Danny? <laughs> like, it's just like Houston. Houston's like a stacked roster. Boston just looks like a stacked roster as well, but with different co color. Look, no, I, I think this roster looks awesome. Uh, the amount that I'm worried about <laughs> this roster, though, is like through the roof. Um, Why? What, what makes you worry? Uh, well, look, I want to see like Decay play a whole season. Uh, I want to see like Bird <laughs> Ring, you know. Look, when, when they're rolling your highlights and your highlight is sniping Zebesai, Zebesai hasn't been in the league in like five years. So like, you know, we got to see Bird Ring start to turn up. And a little bit of a revenge game, right? Against the Gladiators, former team, maybe maybe comes out. Play, yeah. Plays with a little extra something I'm here. I'm sure that's in the back of his mind. <laughs> yeah. He's Bird Ring revenge game. Yeah. very, very strongly about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I mean, Burning Rose was with Gladiators the last time, like before his retirement, right? But I mean, I think this match is interesting because, first of all, we get to see Boston Uprising, like how well are they going to do, right? Because this is their first time playing. And also for Gladiators, I think this is a great test of strength for Gladiators. Like, are they really good? Or was it just like, you know, a, a one-time thing because they were going up against contender teams? Yeah, this is definitely the first time they're going to be tested to the limits, or so we hope, unless the Boston Uprising show up and completely <laughs> flop. But that's unlikely, just given no, the caliber no players we have on that team. I mean, there's a way. I mean, we, we've seen this <laughs> in no the past, Danny. There definitely certainly is a way. Uh, I mean, I, I no. think they probably just have too much talent for it to go that way. Uh, but we've, we've seen this in the past. You know, there is one team each year that there's some we're like, oh, there's no way it goes wrong, and then it just goes horribly wrong. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. There's, there's no way possible. That I feel well, like you're er, speaking er, it into existence, Danny. I don't know. Like, er, that's, earlier, that's not GG. <laughs> earlier, Danny told me that there is like an 180 percent chance that Atlanta <laughs> and Houston. 180? So, what did I say? Said, 180. But, but you said like 90 for both teams. No, so I, like, said, I said 99.9. .9. Okay, that's so even higher. <laughs> yeah. 99.9%. Yeah, math isn't our strong suit here on the desk, uh, but we're really, really good at just claiming things uh, or, you know, making predictions. Also, very good at totally never being wrong. So let's take a look at the predictions for this match because I'm actually very interested to see uh, where we're going with this. I went with the Boston Uprising. Because, let's go. Whoa, okay. Yeah, I mean, this is an unknown. I could think of they could flop but i just don't think it's possible because <laughs> individually they're just so good and the gladiators so far they haven't really been tested they went up against two um contenders teams and they did drop it uh here and there against yeah. those contenders teams so until they got all their ducks in a row i have to go with boston uprising here yeah uh, I'm on the same boat. I went with Boston Uprising. I don't know why you guys are doubting the Boston Uprising. You guys are saying that Boston might flop, but I don't think that's the case. And also Gladiators, yeah, they look strong. I'm not but, doubting them. Like I just Zoe give myself said. an out. <laughs> True. Okay. I mean, no, no, yeah, no, like, no, 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 no,
No, no, you can't. We, we, we're, we're not. You can't can pick I, on both sides. Cannot pick on can both I, sides. Can I finish my sentence, guys? Can okay, I, please. Okay, yes, finish, I'm so Danny, sorry. Please, please. All right. Gladiators look good, but like Sobe said, they were going up against Contenders players and they were dropping maps. So that was worrying for me. So I went with Boston on paper, who look stacked, just like Houston and Atlanta. So I'm betting on them. Well, I took the Gladiators because I'm not uh, picking based off of the game on the paper. Uh, we've seen the Gladiators uh, play pretty well this far. Uh, it's a first to two, so it's a short series, a little bit of a toss up. Uh, and I think Boston, I I think their roster is really great on paper. I think it's probably gonna take a little bit of an adjustment period uh, you know, to bring in all these you know, big personalities from different teams and get them together on the same page. Uh, so I went with the Gladiators here. All right, so much doubt coming from Mr. Yeah. Eggs. I wonder if our casters <laughs> share in on that doubt or if they're also pretty hyped up about that Boston squad. There's only one way to find out, and that's handing it over to Jen and Harry. Oh, we're on first, uh, we're on first name basis. We're getting kind of tight with the desk. I, I, we love nice. to see it. A lot of doubt on the desk though, for real. Like it's almost like the Gladiators are undefeated and this is Boston's first match and there's a lot more hype for Boston. Well, what camp are you sitting in, Leg? <laughs> Uh, I am sitting in the camp of the Kongdu loyalists, baby, because the Blessed Child has returned. He has emerged oh. from the dark ether and back into the light of day. Burgering's back, baby. Woo! And as a legacy Kongdu fan, as a Season 1 London fan, I could not be more absolutely stoked to see this hitscan legend back on the stage. And Tati Peninsula's is going to be our first map. I don't know how to say those words because there there's only one word that I care about saying in this particular cast, and that is Burgering. I know, right? And starting lineups, Birdring's playing alongside Decay. A lot of personality on Boston. A full roster, three supports, three DPS, two tanks. Boston have options. This is a complete rebuild from last season. And I like to joke around and say Boston were just like building up their economy, you know, while all the teams <laughs> were spending their money. They were waiting for their moment to strike. And, you know, if it's not a good season for them, Striker will leave them again. So. <laughs> <laughs> go back to the shock and then come back to Boston. We'll, we'll we'll wait for the ultimate Boston season. I think this could be the season of the uprising. But Gladiators, they've already proven in terms of results that no one's been able to touch them. At least not that when they're warmed up. <laughs> you know how most employment contracts have like a performance clause where you can be dismissed if you're not performing up to par? <laughs> There's a reverse one in Strikers contract. <laughs> <laughs> if Boston boat don't pop off, I'm out of here, baby, as we head on out. Gladiators on the other side. We've already seen them today, and while there were a couple of shaky plays with a double flex in particular, they looked absolutely unstoppable as we move out here onto labs. Dante's going to once again be enjoying the Ramatra, but you could be going up against a more fearsome Winston than the legend himself in Smurf. Yeah, Dante already showed a couple of picks in our earlier match just uh, 15 minutes ago from the Winston, the Doomfist, the Ram. He's trying to counter pick as much as he can, and I think he's quite comfortable in the Winston mirror. And so far, you've lost Babel, you've lost Twilight, and a tank for Glads. Boston ahead, now able to take so much space now that Smurf is free and Bird Ring is unloading. So, first fight for Boston. So check out that cool little thing in RUI there when you look at Smurf. He's got the Roll Star icon in the uh, in the bottom left next to his portrait. And it's a good chance to talk about the accolades of a Boston Uprising. I believe the most title wins of any team we have, Lee Shagon, Izayaki, and Twilight all, all having at least one to their name. Smurf's got one, burgering has got one from Season 1. Only Decay has actually not walked away with a season win himself, but who knows? Season 6 is a bonus here in 2023, and uh, there's always hope, man. Kind of how, like, the, I said the Gladiators were the Avengers. It feels like Boston also took a lot of good pieces from other teams. Decay needing a better team after the Justice. And I was hyping you up for that Pulse Bomb, man. Now Kepster is shining bright on the other side. He gets a pick on the Smurf. Both tanks removed, removed as we have a 4v4 taking place. But Boston just trying to play off of picks. They've actually nanoed Birdering, who slaps Kai in the head, goes for a double kill. But man, Kepsir's also getting those trades. So Boston just barely holding on to this point, falling back now to their healers. Smurf will have presence just to anchor. Burgeoning at 6 HP. He needs a health pack and a cuddle right now. But Smurf, like you said, anchoring down here. And Dante's been heavily denied from actually getting onto any targets. This might be a touch of space for him to work with, though, as Burgeoning channels the dead eye. 
Just trying to zone them off, but that's Nerdo Dante speeding on in. I love that they have Funny Astro too for that high tempo aggression play style. Even Dante in an interview said that this is something he's had to adjust to since his days on the Houston Outlaws. And it feels like a big key to their success to overwhelm teams. And even staggering out Boston late here is big, but Gladiators have uh, quite a gap in the score to close. Oh, that was such a long punch. Mr. Fantastic would be eyeing that enviously. And now Dante has access to the Annihilation. I wouldn't be surprised to see Smurf try and use her Primal Rage potentially to try and control that at the moment. Annihilation still early in its tactical depth where we haven't seen too many specific strats to try and deal with it. Actually, Crandop had one over on the previous Nepal to get Dante off the map, but no Enviro's here. Like this Deadeye, this just zones off Boston, who are just playing on the other side of the map anyway. Gladiators don't need to really force their hand. It's Boston that have to pressure this point. Now Smurf jumps on top of Kai, forces out the barrier for Funny Astro, who speeds the team back out of this dive. Boston cannot stop. They went with their own sound barrier too, but Smurf primals some people off the map, goes after more. And after all the trades are said and done, we have a three on one for the point and Boston will recap it. Okay, so let's talk about right now something that's gonna be highly infusing for every Boston Smurf fan out there. The Smurf heads are super happy. But Smurf, Ligia, Gone and Decay seem to have already entered the hive mind state. Their three-man dives are looking sublime. But Dante still has the annihilation in the back pocket, and it might well need to be popped in this fight if they need the armor refresh, because we're getting towards last fight territory for Boston. Oh, Kai's getting pressured by a Nano Winston and the Bell too, and Dante got slept mid annihilation. The Denai for the burst confirmed that kill. Boston 99%. Quite a statement to make as they just ran circles around this brawl comp of the Gladiators and really showed them how it's done. Oh, and Bertrand at the moment sitting on a princely throne doing so much damage. He's currently on track for 11k damage per 10 minutes. Compare that to Kai on the Cassidy, who's on track for 7.4k damage per 10. Admittedly, Kai was in a losing scenario, but Birdring is hitting the shots right now. And that's what matters most. Retirement did not slow him down. Currently on eight yeah. final blows out of his team's, I believe, seven. And I, I think what's important to consider with the, the big damage gap you just brought on is the fact that Smurf is making a lot more space than Dante is. That big annihilation ultimate of Dante got slept. Shout out to Twilight there. He was a highlight on the Toronto Defiant. You're glad you picked him up. One of the best Anas in the league. And Decay has zero deaths and is following along with Smurf so, so well. We go to sub level now where Brawl is a lot stronger. Yeah, this is where the Brawl can certainly clear out that high ground a lot more easily. The positioning of Twilight here, up in the high ground actually is a choice. Remember that Dante can try and force them out, but that's a great boot from Lee Jagon. What an isolation. Nemesis form for Dante just to kind of have that block available if he takes pressure, but he's climbing back up to that high ground. That means Boston able to take some free space. Point one lock in a second. You got to see those tracers anchor that. Kevster versus Decay. That's an important 1v1 that will determine if Boston have to drop to help him out, if the Glads have to do so as well. Glads dropped to the low ground, and they got some range from Kai. Those headshots are deadly, and Birdring doesn't benefit from that same range and that same one shot. Glads might have capped for now, but Kevster man might have gone in a little too deep. Okay, might well be staggered here. The recall, though, it is lost, and so too is the trace of themselves. Boston Uprising will get away with that. And Decay already trying to pressure the point. Let's see who drops down. Looks like it's Dante who's actually going to be taking up that challenge. Smurf is there to meet them, but now peeling for these squishier backline members might be a touch harder. Smurf might want to jump on top of Kai and does a good job of doing so. He has Lee Gong, he has Nano. What more could you want? The Gladiators, especially Dante peeling for his backline, but when you're bubbled off or when you're getting LOS away from your Ana, he's not getting enough support. No. Kevster's presence in the backline is certainly felt after that full spawn in a 4v4, but Boston losing members, losing the point shortly, trying to anchor that as Decay, who has a pulse, maybe could have a fight turning moment if he can deal with Kevster. But meanwhile, the point held by Boston, who are trying to close the gap in the score. Decay uses the recall, now has to be super careful. Winds of a slow, and Dante's quick to pummel down the Brits. And now escaping from that. Now 
Perhaps this form is going to be top priority. What an anti. Ooh, what annihilation, too. Even if it got bubbled off, he's still got a 3k at the end. Dante showing how it's done. And keeping this high ground, being able to defend it, too, is going to be big for this Brawl comp. Fantastic bit of shepherding as well from Dante to force them into Babel's sightline in order to allow Babel to hit that big nade. Unfortunately, Smurf did a little bit of mischief, a heckin' mischief in the lobby by running a pulse bomb into Lee Jae Gon in a previous fight. So now Lee Jae Gon is a little bit behind on the Sandberry, but still should be viable very soon. Oh, if Boston fight through this choke, they got a Dragon Strike with their name on it, but Kai is holding on to it. Maybe it's going for a split. Oh, no! Lee Jae Gon, not like this! Not your first fight! Oh, Platchat's gonna have a lot to say about this one, but Birdery makes up for it. Double dead eye. Gladiators also don't have Dante slept as he tries to keep on kicking, but he'll be kicking some dirt. Boston flipping the point, but it's at 91 for the Glads. <laughs> you ki you killed my Sambare cast and you activated my trap card. You all looked at Lige gone, and that's when the rest of Boston Uprising could truly get something done. Uh, a little bit of uh, mechanical faux pas there, maybe, on a couple of uh, Gladiator's doors. You can see Decay already looking for this pulse from early. There's not really much we can try and shut it down, but Kev's just faster on the draw. That's two stick kills oh, now for Decay, Decay is very confused on whether to try and peel for Kevster or to follow along with Smurf. He, he got stuck between a rock and a hard place, and Decay... The case impact wasn't felt, at least not in that moment. Kevster got the first kill of that fight. Great pulse, of course, as now Gladiators aim to the point in their favor. Now needing to deal with this bubble. Lee Jae Dong takes a headshot by Kai, who's been sitting comfortably in the back line. Boston cannot afford to lose this fight. 92 and growing as Glads get back the objective. Smurf extremely low. Kai is getting the assist from Funny Astro, and all the kills are coming the way of the Gladiators looking to force a round three. Oh, I feel like we've already got a banger on our hands, and we're not even halfway through Antarctic Peninsula. What a performance from Kevster there. So many critical sticks, including, as we said before, one onto Smith, that he decided to say, hey, uh, Lee Jae Gon, buddy, you got a defuse kit over there by any chance? Come take a look at this. And, uh,. Early kills onto Bertrand, super important. Remember that Bertrand can technically survive that by using the combat role, but uh, <laughs> maybe didn't have it. Maybe a little bit of cooldown timing there from Kevster. Remember, this is actually, I believe, the first time we've seen Bertrand play competitively in Overwatch 2 after the long tenure. And that was, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and say it, Lemon. That was that was downright foolish from Lee Jae Gon. Goofy. A little that hockey was a re real, real goofy barrier. <laughs> Especially with Dante there, you can't underestimate how much damage Ramatra does. Needing to maybe fall back behind his tank would have been the better move. Either way, going to the final round of Antarctic with Smurf on the Doomfist and it's Birdering on the Sojourn. Finding the headshot onto Kai. It's 4v4 though. Got to be using these jumps from Sojourn quite carefully around maybe Kevster and how much pressure he is putting on, but Dante at least can take in a lot of pressure at the front on the Ramatra. Smurf has to take angles around it, but Dante's been antied, is trying to block, but takes too much damage. And nothing that Funny Asher could speed him out of. Gladiator doesn't even get control of the point throughout that. To our light, an absolute raid boss on the honor. His most famous hero for a reason, a legend of the art. Whenever anyone says that they're an Ana main, you ask who their favorite Ana is, I guarantee you that 50% of them at least are gonna say Twilight. Los Angeles Gladiators now, we have to try and cover the distance towards Smurf and Birdring here while dealing with the Doomfist. And Smurf here is gonna be more of a stalling tactic, just trying to buy time for Birdring to build up towards those rails and let them hit home. Yeah, just Smurf punched forward, maybe looking for a better stun, or maybe kind of coordinating with an anti-heal with Twilight would be a good go sign, but he's below 50% HP, jumps in, dies, Dante's getting nanoed, and the pressure on the back line is huge, <laughs> Kevster alongside him, but Decay is, had a few frags here and there, now it's Kevster going after Twilight, not sure if the sleep has been used, and it doesn't matter at the end of the day, Boston will only get 46 off of this first fight. Oh, Smurf comes in though for a little bit of a late, uh, a little bit of a late contest. Not sure if it's overly winnable, but two versus two here. Kevster decides to target the healer instead. It's the basic economy, and indeed the basic economy comes up big here as Dante pops the annihilation. 
Boston still think this is winnable. I mean, they popped the overclock, but I think with the Annihilation, you just want to get away from that as soon as possible. So 46 ended up into 60 after some late stalling from Boston. So not bad. One of the interesting things you've got to think about in this particular compositional matchup is that Dante can block off the heals from Twilight using the shield uh, and then go into Nemesis form after to try and punish Smurf on an engagement. Smurf actually gets oh. nano tier and it's answered with a... Uh, oh, forces out the barrier, yeah, and Kai's rolling back. If it wasn't for that sleep, Kai would be so dead. And Dante's frontline is just bulldozing everyone, so Glad still have to catch up by 30% and they've used a lot of ults to do so. I think Boston there are actually trying for a sound barrier interrupt. Who wanted to put Smurf into a backline with Seismic Slam and then use a quick punch to interrupt Funny Astro's sound barrier cast. But good evasion from Belusia means that it hits ground and Lee Shagon now is going to have a slight advantage on that ultimate. But the advantage in point percentage is going to be lost soon for the Boston Uprising as Decay is already checking Kev's to here, looking for a path into a pulse bomb. Lads. Use the pulse bomb, it misses. Trying to remove Smurf out of the picture. Sound there from Lee Gong. Boston up by three kills. Decay slept, but he's well protected. Now that's a good fight for Boston. Nice double slam kill as well, coming through from Smurf. And Los Angeles Gladiators, they might want to take a little bit of a poke face here. Have Dante catch some incoming damage in order to help. Hold up, what's Twilight up to? Oh no, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, I could lower the alarms. He's not doing anything too silly. Wait, the silliness may continue. Check this out. He's caught the alcove over here. Disengagement is going to be super hard, and he's been scouted. Rescue is going to be necessary. And he misses that sleep, and he misses the sleep. Uh, so, oh, actually, he got it onto Dante. Okay, it didn't look like it hit on my screen. Either way, it looks like they were trying to slow down the tempo of the Glads, who are being separated from each other thanks to the punches of Smurf. Nano, Dante, Annihilation, ready. Kepsir's already killed two, so you don't need to use that ultimate. They will need to flip the point, though. It's 99 for Boston. They have Annihilation and Barrier to think about for the next fight. Oh, a stagger here would be brutal. And indeed it is. Kevster's getting so much good information on the Tracer scouting, as you guys have probably heard. Enemy over here multiple times uh, in your head since starting this particular map. Being able to force resources out to save Twilight, like for sleep, and the anti gave an awesome opening for Gladiators to get some real value out of their own nano. Now Boston going to try and retake here into the Annihilation, but once again, Kevster could shut this down in a singular moment using that false bomb. See, Murdering is the one who gets nano. You don't see that too often, but against the barrier, it's a lot to carve through if you're Murdering. At least you have get rid of Kai. Annihilation from Dante is just a brick wall as Boston pierced through it. Now jumping to the point. Decay with the full spot too. Enough damage as the Boston Uprising in their first map of the Pro-Am will take it against the Glads. Oh, I've got a Sherlock Holmes-esque mystery here that someone in the VODs is going to have to look at, Lemon. Funny Astro, oh. after the Nano Overclock came in, used this sound barrier, it didn't get cancelled, only hit him. Where was Astro? Where was Daniel Hathaway deciding to live? The, the sound barrier didn't grab anyone else. There's no Doomfist that could block off the line of sunlight you'd see usually from a shield, so where was Daniel? What was he up to? It was incredibly close, and this one is a certified Giga Banger already. I couldn't be happier to see this Boston team all yeah. working together and already exhibiting the synergy between Lee Jae Gon, Smurf, and Decay that gets me super excited for a nice dive. What I really liked, because uh, you said that the barrier didn't hit a lot of people, for the Glads to point out that Smurf was so good at dividing the fight, of punching people over on the high ground, having some people fall back to the point. Kai often find himself isolated, and Birdwing, Birdwing was able to win those 1v1s a lot of the time, and then you nano him? That's how much confidence you have in Birdwing after coming out of the retirement home. I'm excited for how the rest of this match is going to break down, but we got to throw it to a break so we can hear from Glads and where their, where their map's going to be.
everyone to what I feel what it feels like the match of the day I think the two most hyped teams in this group facing off Boston star studded roster took map number one it was pretty close though and some cool looks from everyone yeah we've seen some interesting rollouts from both of our teams in terms of the overall stylistic tendencies it already feels like Boston are leaning a little bit towards that faster dive style with Smurf playing both the Doomfist and of course the Winston that he's incredibly well known for both both of our teams have also had a little bit of a swap up here. It seems like there's a lot of depth to these rosters. Eight members at the moment sit on the Boston Uprising. And here's a look at how Los Angeles Gladiators are bringing in for hybrid. Yeah, Funny Astro out played the Ana and the Kiriko as more of a slower pace, but deadlier all offense support line with the Kitsune Rush and the Nano Boston. Uh, feels like a similar vibe. Lee Jae gone out, Easy Yaki in. Maybe a double flex could be in the cards. And on a Kiriko, we will see. And Smurf is out, Kalios in. Okay, Kalios, classically more of one of those off tank players, as we used to call them in Overwatch 1, focusing in more on the Sigma, the Diva, the Zyre, especially for Kalios. But Zyre is not in a good place right now, it feels, in terms of the overall power level. So we're likely going to be seeing Sigma here on first point, or an attempt to rebuff any dives uh, using some of the control that's available to those off tanks. It's Blizzard World that's coming up critically here, though, for the. Los Angeles Gladiators, they haven't bought in the Yaki that they used previously to free up Kerosa to play other non-tracer things in conjunction with a double flex. Gladiators had a lot of success on this map yesterday, though. I think that's why they picked it against the Boston Uprising. Gladiators beat down the Wisp. They stopped them at point B. And when they did get to that box of victory, there were still four minutes left in their time bank. And it was off of the Dante Winston dive, Kai Cassidy, Kevster Tracer, and then the Kiriko on a back line as mentioned. And they looked quite good, but Kai a lot more quiet this series. And I think there's a obviously a compositional difference here of being a Cassidy versus the Sojourn and Kai not having the mobility to get away from a Doomfist and a Tracer always attacking him, but control is always a smaller map. Yeah, let's run over what happened to Kai in the previous map by taking a look at some of the highlights that we've compiled from Eco Point Antarctica between our two rosters here. Obviously, we're not going to be seeing as much of uh, dive tanks from Smurf, but we are going to be seeing plenty more of the king himself. Burgering has returned and is looking bloody good. Twilight as well. So impressive on the Ana, and I think that Izuyaki Twilight is one of the, uh, unironically, one of the rosters of all time when it comes to double flex support. They are they are both him. They both got that <laughs> dog in them. And when it comes to Warlords on flex, uh, on flex support, you could not ask for better than Twilight X's Iaki. Yeah, Twilight had a lot of critical sleeps on the Dante, and you already saw the 
in the replays, you know, stopping the annihilation, slowing down the gladiators who feel like such a high tempo team off of Funny Astro. And I think that's why when they'll, they'll stick to that when it comes to control of playing that Lucio and maybe even Boston mirroring that strategy. But Birdering had quite a showing, was gapping Kai, although obviously there are factors to include, whether it was Smurf diving on the Winston, making a lot more space for Birdering when it came to labs. And then uh, the other maps when you had Doomfist, still more space being created. Dante not able to just close the gap in terms of space to even get uh, near Bird Ring. So he was able to just unload. It was great to watch. Blizzard World, though, you're favoring the Gladiators off of how comfortable they looked on this map yesterday against Wisp. Hey, call me a fanboy here as well, but uh, to return to the Bird Ring Sojourn, Birdring, having not played Overwatch 2 competitively last year, does not have any of the uh, the prejudices that you might have in terms of playstyle from pre-nerf Sojourn. Uh, Birdring knows Sojourn as she is now in a far more balanced state, and maybe that means that the grasp of the kit is going to be a little bit more al natural than someone who's had to change their Sojourn playstyle multiple times over the course of a year as we try to nerf her down to a state where she was both fun and fair. And uh, that might be a slight advantage, even though Bergering here on the attack likely to play the Cassidy to try and control those angles that the Trace is going to want to take. That's going to be down to Kevster, who thus far against Decay, I think has been doing very well in the Trace at all. Maybe there needs to be a touch more uh, attention there from the Boston Uprising to try and help out Decay in those duels. Uh, against uh, Kai Cassidy, definitely going to be tough now that you have the Suzu from the Kiriko. And even asleep, there's lots of things to consider when going up against the Glads. But on the defense, you might have a lot to worry about if a D.Va is going to be the confirmed rollout. I think we might have seen this from the Shock, or at least one other team on Blizzard World, where D.Va is very close range. But man, she packs a punch and she bullies Winston out of his bubble with those micro missiles. And it's more of that reactive play style of just protecting your team. And now with the Zen, this is just going to hurt if the Glads jump in on this. All right, I asked for more help in the Tracer duel, and you can't get much better than the double orb dynamic. See Babel here. Already being forced to TP out. We might see a critical difference between Boston Uprising and Team Pepsi here and how they follow up on Babel's attempts to disengage. He was slow on King's Row. Picked multiple times too early. Babel's going to have to be quicker on the trigger this time and then quicker on the secondary escape as well. Just on the initial dive, Kalios is the one who pulls the trigger first. Would have liked to see Dante in that moment go for a counter dive while Kalios is out of position. Especially if he confirmed that sleep on the Kalios. This is even more time and space for Glads to find themselves in the back line. They have done so already. Killing Twilight is big. And you got no heals at all for a defense, uh, or for this offense, I should say, and no mech either. So Glass waited for Boston to act first, which is interesting. Yeah, just kind of slowly tightening that noose around them and making sure that all of the off angles could be well collapsed upon at the same time from Gladiators. Remember that Bebel can actually all in as a Kiriko by TPing in with Dante if necessary. And that also means that Dante is going to be able to get a lot more quick healing from the Kiriko without having to worry about the travel time of those uh, Funda. Can just stay with Kai on this off angle. Even be explore even more as long as Babel has a dive or a, a teleport target. That's is still pay attention to Kai though. And that's the flex support squirrel brain. If you just want to damage as much as you can, and then you also have to pay attention to your DPS and that pulse barely misses from Decay. Kai had the roll, Dante is slept. It's time to go for Boston. They take shelter in the mini room. Twilight being dove on there by Dante in the back. He's got the assistance of Kevster. Can soon a rush first from Babel as Boston are just barely getting that first tick and they will confirm it as Glass just didn't get really much headway off of the Kitsune rush. Ah, oh, great timing there with the Nano on to Birdring. The second that Dante dove on top of him with the Kitsune Rush, knowing, hey, the escapability of the Winston, we've tracked that he doesn't have it. Oh, hello, Kai on his Specialist. We've tracked he doesn't have a Primal Rage yet, so why not give him a Nano Boosted Fan, the Hammer, and just dispatch the Gorilla for the next turn. Kai, this is where Legends were born. The or you Widow fall asleep. Uh, depends if, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. anyone shows up. Sometimes you, you just want to do your attack FPS style where you'll hold an angle for several thousand minutes and, you know, sometimes you get you get to shoot someone. It's the hunter as as style, he you know. away that. from Kalios. So it looks like Boston are just anchoring the card, getting free push. As Kai 
Might have gotten information about at least a K and Izayaki being in left door. Kalios is approaching, so Kai's going to relocate to the high ground. Now, someone needs to anchor this, so Dante is on the cart. K is not feeling good about that duel, especially with the Primal Rage that's been probably called out. Boston in the room, trying to avoid as much poke and denying sidelines from Kai. As Dante looked like he was trying to enter that and is at least dislodged Kalios from the room. But Dante not able to produce much outside of that. Decay found his way into the high ground to pulse bomb Kai. And Gladiators didn't get any picks that they were hoping for. Uh, Kalos actually forced that Primal Rage by body blocking Dante in the room with all of the members of Boston Uprising. A huge big brain play that forced a huge resource out of Dante without really using anything on the side no of the Boston Uprising. Previously, side. Gladiators have been able to get huge amounts done here by forcing out early resources from Tracers to try and dislodge Babel, but, or Bibble rather. But Decay's been doing very well and chasing up Bibble afterwards and making sure that they could naturally uh, regenerate that teleport cooldown. These Boston's have access to the high ground. The card is in pretty deep. Oh, the headshot. Oh, that was Kevster. I heard the dink. Either way, Boston <laughs> is playing things slow, and I think if they keep waiting for Glads to jump into them, being too antsy, that Boston do have good punishing power. They've already proved that when Dante went in too deep inside of the room where, like you pointed out, the whole Boston uprising were there. Presence now on the cart. It's just Kalios. Yes, self-destruct. He's going to use this as his secondary life option. Twilight will nano bird ring. Lights up Dante, who's been nano, so the damage mitigation going big here. Gladiators punishing Boston, who went too deep to try and confirm that kill onto Dante. And Gladiators get a good hold. Excellent focus fire there. Twilight's on top of the vending machine, but I'm afraid that it's keeping your snacks, mate. And you're going to have to go back off to spawn. Now Los Angeles Gladius is there in a very enviable position where we've got a huge amount of early poke damage between the Widowmaker and the Kiriko. And Bertrand. Oh, now this is a duel that I would pay to see. One of your best. Here. It's free to watch. <laughs> <laughs> head scratches, head scratches. <laughs> They're not even going to see each other. Wah. We need to just like, screw this match. Let's go into a win a 1v1, okay? This is what the people are here to see. Because <laughs> it's both teams just waiting for the other person, the other team to make the chess move first. Kalios and friends on Boston. Few more meters to go. Kai picks off Decay. 5v4 for the defense. So getting a DMAC on the Kalios would be ideal, even forcing out the self destruct. You don't want to use that though. Kalios is going to get burned down by Kepster in a second. And I wonder if they're going to leave him out of mech. Yeah, they are. But Tracer's role as multitude in this comp, and it's a very dynamic role where you have to simultaneously mark the enemy Tracer to stop them from being able to get too far into your own backline, but also the Tracer's responsible for a good amount of information gathering as well to aid the uh, the Widowmakers and being able to find their targets. Only 20 seconds remain now. Boston Uprising are very quickly running out of time here on second point, and we could see a repeat performance of Los Angeles Gladiators' previously impregnable hold on second here of Blizzard World. There's plenty of resources try and make it through that oh. no dev you got sight lines here a huge advantage informational advantage for kai pays off shouldn't be peeking that now you don't have the transcendence for this final fight kitsune rush from the bell and the gladiators in a prime position to be taking or at least holding off this push to point b with ultimates to spare just based off of map positioning, the, the Gladiators gave Kai such a big kind of gap for Bird Ring, who just only had the small room to really operate from. Then Boston had a good punish on the Dante when he got too eager to just slap their DPS around, but Boston couldn't really produce much after that. Yeah, Kai, like you said, so much more space because of the layering of the Gladiators' defense. You kind of had almost a, a faux front line of Kevster and Babel who was kind of playing around Kevster, knowing that he could TP out for free easily, and you can hit easy headshots on Widowmakers as well, because they're slowed down while scoped in, and they got a big old headshot hitbox that the Bell can really exploit. And that means that you've got to do a lot of groundwork as Boston Uprising to dislodge Kevster, to make room for Decay, to dislodge the Bell, to make sure that you aren't going to get sniped in the side of the head by someone who can get out for free. And this also gives a huge amount of information over to Kai as well. 
And honestly, we, we did see Izayaki ego check on Kai and was made to pay for it. But I think that Gladiator's layered defense here on Blizzard World Point B is going to be one that they continue to fall back on throughout the Pro-Am. And I think Dante was able to reel back a bit. I think he's, you know, you go from being super aggro in control with a Lucio, with funny astral Lucio escorting you around to a more slower and measured style when Boston, they have the Zen, they have the Diva. This is just to blow up Dante as many times as possible. And he felt that on a, a couple of missed fights uh, at the point. And he was able to dial that back and just rely on his DPS. And maybe not something Dante is used to doing, but he's on the attack. It's Kevster Widow this time, but just for maybe that, maybe that initial pick back to the tracer. So Vizai is real. I brought it up at the beginning of this match. I, I didn't think it would be real, but it might be a re tier on Kalios, knowing that Kalios is likely to play the Diva. This is going to give a lot more capacity for Babel to continue surviving. And Lastro on the uh, on the Lucio is actually something we're familiar with, thanks to Lastro's uh, time on the uh, the, uh, the Yacht Wars last year. So yeah, like Zarya, rock, paper, scissors matchup. You got the scissors against paper. Dante could be very selfish with these bubbles. Maybe throw one to Kevster where he really needs a bone, but gladiators have the counter to the Boston comp. Look, Dante's even going to the back line while Kalios has slept. There's no one to protect Boston at this point. And gladiators already gotten a first tick. Maybe uh, they should turn around and deal with the flankers, but either way, this is a one fight for glads. <laughs> it feels kind of personal that Dante just rushed down to our light. I mean, if you're sick of getting slept on your engage as a tank, you can just play Zarya. The sleep doesn't do more than five damage. It will not break through that bubble. Dante just absorbs, just eats up, gobbles up all of this Ani utility as she moves on forward. Izayaki now being able to leverage some high ground over Zenyata might make Dante a touch more vulnerable. But you've got to hold this second point here of Blizzard Bond for five minutes, Lemon. And that's multiple alt cycles and pressure cycles from the Gladiators that you're going to need to have to survive and win multiple mechanical duels to do so. We already said this was a strong map for Glads and winning, which is unlocking the payload within the first fight, is already a little bit faster than Boston. They're getting free push. This is going to be the battle of ranged hit scans where Kai can get those random headshots, get picks just like he did on uh, Nepal's Sanctum. Glads now have to try and dislodge Kalios. It'll be up to Dante to take that duel, use his bubble selfishly, especially during the micro missiles, especially if he's taking a lot of pressure. He's already used one and Kalios trying to trap him in. Dante is fading attention towards himself and he's winning the duel against Kalios, who has to fly back up towards Twilight. Now the grab just to get Verdering, but he gets Nando. So he survives the ultimate, but meanwhile, Gladiators are getting so much free push until Kalios is back to anchor. But this high ground presence from Boston is dangerous. Two kills for Birdring after he survived the grab and he's not even done here. The support there, super solid. Not only the Nano, but the full defense matrix as well. Just smothering Birdring, making sure that no projectile is able to reach the electric cowboy. And Kalos is doing a good job here of continuously disrupting Dante and making Kai divert his crosshair over towards Kalios, who he can't one-shot. Because remember that Kai in this duel has a much greater effective range than Birdring. He can headshot at any range due to lack of damage drop-off. Birdring's own damage is going to be significantly nerfed by the damage drop-off of Cassidy. Got Barrier versus Transcendence too. Both really good Temple Ultimates. Especially now that you don't have the grab to worry about. You don't have Dante to worry about. There is no tank. Boston can stop the push. I guess uh, Lastro is there and he just beat it, him and Kepster. Uh, I guess they really feel like they're a team without Dante. They're getting sub card push, but I'm not sure about that Lastro call. That was... That was potentially like several minutes worth of losing from that Lastro call. This might well come back to bite Lastro. As Kalios, he's happy to just sit here and start doing some tanking. You gotta be careful not to shoot too many of the shields just to mitigate the amount of damage that Dante will be able to put out onto him and generate, of course, that all important Graviton surge. Meanwhile, everyone else can just sit up on high ground. It's just so tough for Glads to fight front to back without Dante. Now he's in the picture and he's been nanoed. He's probably got a lot of energy as Kalios wants to slow them down. Almost makes Dante for the Twitter clip. He's giving him the micro missiles, but the bubble from Dante ate so much of that damage. 
still two minutes and ten left for the Glads, who feel dismantled. Even Izayaki is killing both supports. Like, what is this game? <laughs> It's a drop down from high ground game. It was the same both times around. Accessing this high ground is so difficult against these double flex supports. And now, though, the car pressure has changed the dynamic of the battlefield. Izayaki has to play down on low ground and Twilight falling down early. This is the chance for Gladiators to win, and they've got a Graviton Surge to try and make it happen. Kalios can stand in the way of this, though, if he eats the Graviton Surge. That's a big ask. At least Kalios is there, but he, someone has to maintain the cart, by the way. We don't want a C9. Decay takes care of Kai, so you won't have the Dragon Strike through the Graviton as you would have hoped. So, big heads up play from Boston, but presence from Gladiators playing front to back. Now that there's no tank standing in their way, but the flank pressure from Izayaki and Decay was too much for Glads to handle. Decay is him. There's no other way to say it. If you guys haven't, by the way, check out Yiska's video on Decay as a gatekeeper. Fantastic look into Decay's career and how this might be his chance to truly claim the championship that everyone else on this team, with the exception of Kalios, has under their belts. Now it's Gladiators who are feeling the sting of time against the back of their neck. Kai, yes, has a Dragon Strike. It will likely be used to dislodge some of these less mobile supports like Izayaki and Twilight, but Twilight can counter any incoming aggression and major damage spikes with a Nano Boost. Kai thinking, oh, I could plant this Dragon Strike to at least force the supports of Twilight Izayaki down, but not getting the information he needed. Boston have high ground control, and the Nano on the burn ring to save him from the Pulse Bomb of Kevster. This team is next level. Gladiators only have 18 seconds. They had all the time in the world. The box of victory in their sight to force the final decider map. Dante's been nano now onto the Diva, trying to chase down Calio so they can get the meterage they need. But another target steps into the picture. It's a bomb from Bird Ring. The transcendence to keep this defense kicking. Gladiators could not deal with the retirement home buff. The Boston Uprising stalled for minutes and minutes and will take the 2-0 over the Gladiators. The Bobston Uprising go big there with Bergering just about getting the bob at the most critical of junctures, surviving due to the quick witted use of the nano to save them from the pulse bomb there. Twilight, it's so important that Twilight held his nerve in the penultimate fight as well. There were so many times after you lost Kalios, you're like, we've got to fight on the car. We, we need to give over the nano to someone who can try and contest this against the high energy Zarya. We need someone to keep contesting this, but Twilight held his nerve. For instead, no, my mechanics can carry me through this. I'm I'm gonna hit every heal. I'm gonna hit every nade and save the nano for when it was needed most, keeping the old veteran alive and making sure that Bob would hit the streets running. Not the most efficient ultimate usage from Gladiators too, right? I mean, some of it not their fault when they had the big Graviton Dragon Strike combo. The one to rule them all for that final fight. Kai gets killed by Decay, I think. Something happened to Kai. Dante throws a grab and then even his first grab, um, I think it was onto Bird Ring and then he gets nano So many times, Bird Ring got saved by a nano. His supports are on top. I feel like the player of the match should almost go to the Boston's backline <laughs> for how many times they've salvaged fights. And obviously some goofy calls from the Glad, some inefficient ultimates, to, uh, thinking about the sound bearer from Lastro, things like that. So yeah, I think there was a very clear defining player of the match leg day. You all know who it is. Your player of the match is Bird Ring. Call in to your friends who are fans of Apex, say, my friend, my fan of Kongdu, my homie. Are you breathing right now? Are you good? Have you been experiencing a wave of almost deadly nostalgia from seeing Bergering dominate the lobby? It's been a big day to come back. A new game, but the same old crown sitting on the same old head. What a performance it's been from a hitscan legend. I think this was such a... We, we favored... Gladiators coming into this map, but when the cart was as deep as it was, Boston just swapped to this super passive playstyle where Kalios initially was chasing Dante around on the Winston, but then peeled back, and all he did was sit on the cart and wait for Bird Ring and Decay to make plays. And I think this forced a, a type of panic from the Gladiators. For example, that beat engaged from Lastro without Dante alive. Dante solo grabbing a Cassidy. 
obviously you want more targets in there or going for the panic grab and then Kai not maybe communicating the tracer pressure he was experiencing and dying to that. So Gladiators just couldn't really make the best decision under probably all the comms and probably new comms considering Gladiators are picking so many strong and loud voices from other teams. Yeah, uh, a five minute hold on point B is a lot of time to ruminate upon potential failures and for that tension to build. But it's when that tension builds, you look towards veterans. That's exactly what this team on Boston's made of. It's 100% veterans, wall to wall. We've got world title, world title, roll star, roll star, world titles, and MVPs maybe sometime in their future. Smurf came bloody close, I'll tell you that. And honestly, when the chips are down, these are the guys who don't make the mistakes and they keep their nerve. And that's what allows them to hold Blizzard World Point B for five minutes. That's a tough first match for Boston to have. And they start off 1-0 in groups. Gladiators getting their first ever loss. But I don't think there's been any worries in any of the communities because these are the two favorites for this group. And a lot of the, de the desk were favoring the Boston Uprising. I'm wondering how much Mr. X is going to get bullied on that. We're going to throw a toy break so we can see the live Mr. X bullying. We'll see you after this.
as you just saw on your screens, Bob getting things done. That's right. And a long bob. Uh, of course, the entire team uh, made it work as well. What a great match that was. Though. Yeah. Love that they played it close. Lots of fantastic highlights. Lots of great moments to break it down. And that's what we're here for at the Watchpoint uh, game break. So let's uh, start from the top map number one. What are your thoughts heading into this? I mean, you can see uh, just from that little brief clip, uh, as I believe this is the yeah, bird ring getting a kill, but. I mean, you just see how fast Lee J Gon gets in there. I mean, he is, uh, you know, there, there are some people, you know, Call of Duty is called playing your life. He is not playing his life. He is just getting in there and it's either working or it doesn't. But uh, I know for Boston, it was really great to see Bird Ring just back in general, right? Uh, I know we yeah. talked to him a little bit yeah. earlier today, but like, you know, Overwatch, Esports Overwatch League, like the scene is better when Bird Ring is around and playing well uh, i think like one of the original players just kind of like everybody fell in love with uh way back in the day uh you saw a little bit of the widowmaker come out uh from him as well but uh, th this guy is just... really close just down to the wire uh, yeah. overall in the series but i mean like bird ring it's crazy how like this guy took a like a very long break right he was out of the league for about a year and he just comes back and i honestly think he got better like how he played Sojourn, he was uh, an all right, Danny, Ash, hold, on, Cassidy, hold on, hold on, hold on. Widowmaker, Danny, he was Danny, flexing Danny, on Danny, all Danny, these Hiscan, Hiscan heroes. And he was like, you know what? I still got it. I can win this. And he did. We saw like nine minutes of Bird Ring playing. <laughs> but boy, uh, that were those I think fantastic it was nine minutes. <laughs> well, well, when, he, when he stopped like playing, we were like, oh, Bird Ring's like one of the best. Like he could be like the best DPS player in the world. I mean, I, and, and I think he did. <laughs> well, he just did. <laughs> he just yeah, did. He I love the enthusiasm, break. Danny. Don't let don't let Matt rain on your bird ring parade. Like, don't let yeah. that happen. Uh, but you know, as great and as pop off as bird ring was naturally, because that's just what he does. I think a lot of that, and that's something Lemon Kiwi and Leg Day hit on, was also just due to the support line. Like Twilight and Izayaki, yeah. they coddled him. They kept him alive. They used all of their abilities just so well to make sure that he has the survivability he has the room to just do the bird ring things and that was just really really great to see yeah. like i was just i was surprised by how well twilight played on that honor because we all knew how we all know how great of a honor player he is but like you know landing those cru crucial nades those sleeps onto like dante and like he was like you said um there was moments where you know they were uh focusing on bird ring and just Twilight was just refusing to let him die. Like, just giving him nanos. He was like, you you are not going to die. Just keep <laughs> shooting, brother. And yeah, and they, they just did that. Well, yeah, I, that's I the was, kind of support you need to have. Yeah, I was pretty impressed with Boston overall. Uh, I, I think the things you're worried about with them Doubter. after seeing that is... Uh, are they like easily readable whether you have Kalios or Smurf in the game? Uh, and then if they're going to play fast, like... Lee J Gun needs to play a little slower than like really, really, really <laughs> fast. Like, uh, you know, um, there's no slow in his playbook. He can go faster, faster. <laughs> like that's Lee J Gun's ways. <laughs> yeah, he's like Sonic the Hedgehog. He's just out. He's just running. He's just going there straight. But like, um, yeah, they got to figure out a way to kind of uh, play around that or get used to that style of play. Because although that is his style of play, right? Like that's what he does. Uh, so you don't want to take that away from him because you take away the really talented player he is. It's just uh, figuring out those two things, I think, for Boston uh, and the rest of the roster. I mean, you're looking fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a similar scenario as what we've seen with the Florida Mayhem, right? Like, you, you know that when they're popping on, on the server, like, you expect something aggressive, you're expecting fast pace, and we're going to see kind of the same thing developing for the Boston Uprising. So interesting to see if they're going to have more different looks in their playbook or not. For now, however, we have an interview lined up for you. So, Danny, please take it away. Thank you so much, Zoe. And we have a post-match interview with none other than the greatest hitscan player or so or, or what Birdwing himself said in the pre-show. <laughs> we have Birdwing for the post-match interview. Birdwing, can you hear me? Yes, hello. Oh, it's, it's been a while. I feel like we haven't talked in a very long time. 
말하는 것 같습니다. <웃음> so, uh, you know, I want to start off this interview by talking about this match because, you know, everyone knows and we talked about in the pre-show how, you know, you took a long break and now you're back in the league and you just had your first match. How did that feel? Did, were you nervous at all? Or like, you know, how, how, how did that match go for you? 자, 첫 번째 질문은 우리가 방금 프리쇼에서도 얘기를 했다시피 버딩 선수가 좀긴 공백 시간을 갖고 이제 오랜만에 다시 돌아와서 어, 굉장한 모습을 보여줬습니다. 어떻게 버딩 선수 처음으로 오랜만에 어, 경기에 뛰신 소감 한 말씀 부탁드릴게요. 어, 일단 굉장히 오랜만에 경기를 뛰게 돼서 이 리그에서 뛰게 돼서 너무 좋았고 일단 기본적으로 제가 아직 많이 부족하거든요. 그래서 훌륭하신 저희 코치님들이 있어서 아직 게임을 배우는 입장이라서 앞으로 좀더더 더 좋은 모습을 보여드릴 수 있을 것 같습니다. All right. Um, it's definitely been a while, but I mean, it just feels so good to be back playing in the league. Um, you know, I'm. I think I'm still uh, lacking, and I think I still need a lot of catch up to do. But we have great uh, coaching staff in uh, in the Boston Uprising, and I'm I'm learning. I'm still in that learning phase uh, about you know relearning the game again for the Overwatch League. Um, you know, I feel like today you had an awesome performance, even though you said that you were still in that learning phase, learning the game back again. Uh, would you say? What was something that you guys lacked? Of course, you guys got the win, but I feel like uh, there was there's always something to be learned. So, what is something that you guys sort of you saw that in the in the match that was being played that like oh like we need to work on this? 자, 두 번째 질문 방금 버딩 선수 말씀하셨다시피 저 아직도 배우는 단계다라고 말씀하셨는데 경기는 제가 봤을 때 너무나도 좋은 모습을 보여줬지만은 어떻게 이기면서도 이번 첫 번째 경기를 하면서 좀 느낀 점이나 아 우리 팀이 보스턴 팀이 아직 좀 이런 거를 좀더 열심히 해야겠구나라고 좀 느낀 게 있나? 물론 경기는 이기긴 했지만 저희가 마음에 들 정도로 깔끔하게 이기진 못해가지고 아직도 저희가 부족하다는 걸 알고 있고 그걸 이제 좀 점점 이제 프로암에서 보완해가면서 어 좋은 모습을 보여드리고 정규 시즌에서도 잘 해보도록 하겠습니다. Okay. Um, yeah, it is true that, you know, uh, we did get the win, but it, I, I believe our fight or how we won the match wasn't as clean as we wanted uh, We wanted to be. There's definitely some lacking parts in our team, uh, I guess, team-wise. So I think those things with time and with more practice, I think it's going to get better. And I think we're going to work on that uh, through the pro -Am and also throughout the whole season as well. All right, I'm going to wrap this up with a final question. Uh, Birdring, there's a lot of talk in the Overwatch community after you made a comeback you know there's who which bird is the best bird in the overwatch league because we got hawk we got pelican and we got you as well so i want to hear your thought who is the best bird in the league 자 마지막 질문입니다 버딩 선수가 다시 돌아오면서 지금 오버워치 커뮤니티에서 굉장한 말이 많이 돌고 있죠 어 어떤 조류 선수 좀 말이 좀 이상한데 자, 어떤 새가 리그에서 제일 어, 좀 좋은 새인가라는 말이 많습니다. 호크 선수, 매 선수도 있고요, 펠리칸도 있고요, 그리고 이제 버드링 선수도 있는데 어, 어떤 새가 제일 어, 잘하는 새인 것 같으신가요? 그 이유 좀 부탁드리겠습니다. 일단 당연히 저라고 생각하고 어, 이유는 뭐 없습니다. 그냥 제가 더 잘한다고 생각하기 때문에 이번에 정규 시즌이든 프로암에서든 제가 다 잡으러 가는 모습 보여드리도록 하겠습니다. All right. Uh, it's of course me. Bird ring is the best bird. Reason? There's actually no reason because I'm just better. Uh, I'm 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 going to work a lot harder to get all those other birds to get on top of them and become the best bird in the league for the pro am and also for the regular season. All right, bird ring. Thank you so much for your time. Again, big congratulations on the win. 자 오늘 승리 축하드리면서 보내드리도록 하겠습니다. 감사합니다. 감사합니다. Thank you so much, Birdring. I mean, Birdring is that's not even a bird, so I don't know if he can it's claim bird the supremacy. It's got bird in the name, it counts. Bird. It's, a, it's a bird that has a ring. True. Sure. That's a lot that's of drip a for a bird. I guess that yeah. gives him the upper hand. I don't know. Championship um, ring. Oh, oh mm. there we go. Oh. oh. <laughs> Dang it, I should, have, I should have said that in my question. No. Ah, yeah, in hindsight, that would have been really smart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, it's great. It's great to hear from him, though. I love the, that he comes out humble, like looking like an absolute monster on the server, and then goes like, "Yeah, you know, I'm still learning. I wish I would look like that when I'm still learning the game." I like, thank you very much, making me feel bad about everything I've ever done in my life. Uh, but yeah, he looks like he didn't skip a beat. Can't tell that he's been on a hiatus, uh, that he's been retired for over a yep. year. So it's great to have him back. It's a better league for it for sure, and we are excited. Excited to see more of him now. However, I do uh, do want to quickly chat about um, 
our next match because we have uh, we have another one for you. That's right. We do have, of course, a quick change in schedule due to some weather issues. But other than that, uh, we are uh, back on track with uh, the uh, next um, match. You get Boston again, Zoe. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So Bird Boston... Ring can be interviewed for the third <laughs> time today after this You know game. what? Let's do it. Let's do it. Today, we're going to make it a Bird Ring day. Yeah. If Boston wins, I mean... Bird Ring is going to be so and it's like, why do they keep wanting to talk to me? August, August 14th is the Valiant show of Overwatch League, <laughs> and uh, March 31st will forever be known as the Bird Ring episode. It's the Bird Ring day. Of, of Overwatch League. <laughs> I, mean, we, I mean, we talked a lot about Bird Ring. I quickly want to talk about Decay as well. Let's talk about Decay. Hey, yeah. Decay. Who plays with Tracer Bird God. Ring? Plays with Bird Ring. <laughs> he plays with Bird Ring. Yep. He's a <laughs> Tracer God. I think he is one of the most talented Tracers that we got. And, you know, sadly, because I, I feel like because all, all of the teams that he was in, he uh, unfortunately, you know, could he could have done better, but he couldn't. But I think with this <laughs> Wait, <what>? new Boston <laughs> Uprising roster, I think yeah. this is a time. Uh, Matt, you don't think so? You don't think this I, is a time? I, I that... feel like Decay has had plenty of chance to be pretty good uh you know but i i do think uh with this roster danny i think your kind of point earlier uh they have like a ton of championship like experience right like across the board uh with players on this roster that like this would be the one that would work right uh you know you get him in this type of situation with players who you know you can win with right you've seen win in the past uh and, and he can just pop off do his thing that's right. Well, we have one more match for you. I'm very excited to see this one go down. But first, we're going to head into a very quick break and we'll be right back right after that.
Welcome back to Watchpoint. We're here in a game break, setting you up for the next match coming your way. Danny and Matt Morello are joining me for this one still, uh, because we just can't get rid of Matt. It's, it's crazy. I don't. Yeah. I don't understand. What about Danny? He's Why are you still here? here? Danny is like a station. Where am I gonna go? He belongs. <laughs> what do you mean? He lives in go? this. Box. Where am I gonna go? You, you could cast. If I leave here, then where do I? Where do I go? I have nowhere to go. That's pretty existential. I love that. Uh, now uh, let's take a look at the schedule. <laughs> this is our revised schedule, of course, uh, due to some weather uh, issues over uh, for uh, Redbird Esports. Uh, we had to uh, postpone uh, their matches. We'll update you on that shortly or as soon as we can, so you know when the uh, catch-up matches will be played. But for now, our last match of the day will be fought out between Wisp and the Boston Uprising. Boston just took on the Gladiators. It was a close match and a very exciting one. And Wisp definitely have to punch upwards for this one. Yeah, I mean, Wisp yesterday they played against the Los Angeles Gladiators. They had some good looks, but, you know, unfortunately, they did get the L. Um, I think Chopper and Rocket have a lot of work to do because they are going to go up against Bird Ring. God, I'm saying Bird Ring so many times. <laughs> this whole day. It's living rent-free in your head. Yeah. I love it. It's, you know, they did take the L, but I mean, th today again, it's unfortunate, but it is going to be a tough fight for Wisp. If you're unaware, Bird Ring's back. <laughs> He's back in a big way. Uh, no, I, I agree. I, I think it's going to be a little bit difficult uh, for uh, Team Wisp in this matchup. Uh, but I, I'm excited as well. We get to see more of this Boston Uprising team. I'm really fascinated uh, you know, by, by their backline, the experiment to kind of bring Bird Ring back. Um, you know, when I saw the announcement, uh, I was like, what? I was like, Bird Ring? I was like, he hasn't played in like, it feels like ages. Um, but seeing him come back uh, clearly, you know, doesn't, doesn't feel like he's lost a step this far. So maybe a brilliant move here uh, for the Boston Uprising. Uh, but really good support line here for Boston. I, I definitely want to highlight them, you know, looking coming into yeah. the series. I, I mentioned, you know, keeping Lee Jake on, uh, you know, more alive than what he currently is at times. Um, but, you know, Izzyaki and Twilight are fantastic as well to combo. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I do wonder, uh, I mean, obviously, Wisp, I'm sure they have been watching the Boston Uprising play just now, and maybe they took some notes. Maybe they are able to shut down that aggression. Maybe they can punish that. Uh, however, on the other side, it is a giant Boston Uprising coming in with absolute legends, and you can support him uh, right at home by getting yourself some Uprising support bundles. They're on sale right now. 350 uh, League tokens is what it will cost you, but it pays off big times because they'll look Looking good. You can get a team weapon charm, so absolutely worth it. That will uh, happen until April 11th. She's right 11th. there. That's right. Yeah, so that's soon. So get him right now. Uh, we do have to do predictions for this one, although I do not expect any surprises. That said, Never though, know. we do have Danny on the desk, so he sometimes, <laughs> you know, just like throws it all over. I would be surprised if it happened for this one. I'm going to go Boston Uprising. I, I don't actually think I need to explain myself. Danny, what you got? Boston. <laughs> just, about Boston. Just, yeah. Is it uh, because of Boston. Bird Ring? Do you want to huh? talk about <laughs> He wants uh, that, He wants that triple even, interview. No, uh, actually, you know what? If Birdie wants to, if Birdie wants to do the third interview, sure, I'll do it. He, he wants he wants <laughs> birding at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He wants to catch him at the end of the day here. Uh, I am but Boston I think... winning this as well uh, because I want to see the triple the triple birding interview day. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't uh, think there's going to be surprises, but I very much hope yeah. to see some resistance from Wisp. I mean, they ha they have a talented roster. We did see some uh, bright spots in their game yesterday, yeah. but as I said before, they are punching upwards. This is an uphill battle yep. for them, so let's see what they can get done. It's going to be an exciting one for sure. And for all the action, we're going to now hand it over to, what are we going to call her? Nekiri? Vikra? I kind of uh, like both. I, I don't know. Do I have to make a decision? Necro Kitty. I think it was Necro Kitty. Yeah, I but think that was it. Vikra Nekiti is way better. Vikra <laughs> Nekiti? Uh, I can't. Sure. Like, sure. Well, let's hear it from them. Maybe they accept there. one of those. I'm we're just, I'm just brainstorming. This is Babel. I think space. you need to make it easy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, make it they, will, easy. they will walk you Babel? through all the action for this one. So enjoy. 
We have fused like bird and ring. I mean, when we talk about bird, we gotta bring it up all over again. I know it's a national holiday out here for the Overwatch League official podcast. What's good, guys? Vicky Kitty here with my lovely partner Necro. We're gonna be taking you guys through the last series of the day. That's gonna be the Boston Uprising versus Wiz. Listen, I love all the names that are being thrown out for the two of us. None of them can be worse than me and Trid getting called naked when that ended up <laughs> happening in Contenders. So, like, no. listen, I will take absolutely anything at this point. But, Vicky, what a treat to be back here with you for the Overwatch League Pro-Am, where we get a chance to see two more teams go head-to-head -head today. And I'm really pumped about this one because we just saw such an impressive performance coming out there from the Boston Up. Uprising. And for Wisp yesterday, their match versus the Gladiators was surprisingly close. Yeah, close rounds. Yeah, although the Glads did take it 2-0, they were still close. And we talked about Wisp, and we highlight them because it's a team, obviously, that we don't get to see very often unless you're tuning into contenders frequently out here. Jaycaru has been a main tank that they just recently picked up for this program. And I like this change up here because we've seen Jaycaru so much back in our days of casting contenders, Necra. And Against a team like the Boston Uprising, after what they just looked right now, uh, unlucky. This is a very scary team. I was tweeting about it earlier. We heard about it from Leg Day and Lemon. This is basically an all-star lineup owl team, and they are not playing around. I love to see Bird Ring right back at his finest peak form. It looks like this man definitely did not take a break. I don't know no. if he's saying that just for everyone <laughs> to be like, oh yeah, you know, we'll, we'll give you some room. But he is out here, and I know Danny wants to interview him again for dinner later yes. today. Yes, so let's we're go. Gonna see. Triple crown. <laughs> <laughs> Do the triple crown there with Bird Ring. Add another one to the gauntlet here because Wisp, I mean, they did put on a great performance, but I am with the desk here that Boston Uprising should be able to take this match. So let's see if Wisp has any surprises in store for us. As we head out of the gates here, Vicky, we are seeing Winston compositions go head to head. It's going to be a mirror match on both sides, but look at the ante to kick things off there coming in from Twilight. Already really nice here. Look at the way that Lee Jae Gon's taking position off to the side, too. Could also just disengage quickly if they want to re-engage onto the point. Match that with Smurf. Like this slow, methodical approach right here, Wisp taking the longer route to try to take the back end of the point. Bit of Here comes the engagement down. right now. Yeah, you can see right there too with Jakaru just trying to jump in. A very similar look to what we saw from Wisp when they were kind of trying to contest the Glads yesterday. That's their win condition. It's Aki trying to get that nano boost onto Jakaru. A nice anti coming in from Twilight. This backline, like we had it earlier before, is beautiful. Enables Burgering, gets him right into position, and they've already lost Jakaru. Now Lee Jae Gon just trying to retaliate. Nice stall real quick after getting hit with an anti. Tries to boop him off real quick right there too, and they do manage to get the point first. See you later, Rocket. Yeah, right. Rocket's just gonna go ahead and get a quick reset there. Otherwise, you run the risk of donating over even more ultimate charge there to the Boston Uprising. And Whisper in for a little bit of a hard time, I would say, as they come back in to try to recontest this point. Boston Uprising already have that dead eye ready to go there from Burn Ring. And you also have a pulse bomb there that Decay is definitely looking at to try to land on two FP or Chopper. And that, there's that nano boost too, but Smurf can't lift through it all. Burgery clearing some extra space over to the side. Meanwhile, Decay on the other side, getting that pulse bomb stick onto Chopper. Nice trade real quick with Chopper going down. The sound barrier from Grapes to keep Wisp alive to contest in that choke point. It's the Rocket versus Decay match though that I was expecting to see going into this matchup. We saw it earlier with Kevster, then we get to see it from Rocket. We talked about him earlier. Taking a little quick nap is Smurf. He managed to get out of there just in time, but the same cannot be said about Burgering. Smurf with that reset on the primal. Lee Jae does have that sound barrier here too. We see some traits, but the Uprising have the numbers in their favor. We almost saw the flip, but Wisp were forced to reset after losing too many bodies. Yeah, there was still a lot of great ultimate conversion there from Wisp. You have the sound barrier that was able to keep Wisp alive through that engagement, and it also enabled Rocket to be able to get a great pulse bomb stick there onto Bird Ring. There are not too many players, Vicky, that I think can say that they've been able to accomplish that. But now Boston Uprising are entering into that final fight territory and Twilight's already gotten a big pick there on the rocket. Oh, Twilight. He's been doing really well on getting these antis here too. I mean, talk about the antis. He got one on Grapes, a follow-up coming in from Decay. The leap from Smurf to finish off what's left some whiffs as Jakaru is forced to pop the Primal to disengage. So much also wasted right there too. Meanwhile, Uprising, they still got Decay's Pulse Bomb. They got the Sound Barrier. Not one flip yet coming in from Wisp as the desperate leap in from Jakaru to stall. 
looks like there's going to be a little bit of the fight happening over on the spawn side, but that does allow some room there for Whisk to get the flip. Boss Star Rising are oh, no. still up, though. There's the sound barrier. There goes the sound barrier. The pole is right there. Decay doesn't even need to burn it. He's already melting down everybody else with Smurf. He puts it down. Rocket Yak gets one pick, but the Uprising are cleaning up shop of what's less from Wiz. Yeah, they got the flip on the point, but it's just delay delaying the inevitable here. You can see the diff right now between Decay and Rocky. It's actually insane. Overtime ticking away and nobody in sight to touch. Yeah, that was a little bit of a rough round there from Wisp, but they still put up a heck of a fight. Being able to get that flip as well did give them some time to be able to try to uh, work back up to some of those more critical ultimates, but Boston Uprising just kind of putting on a clinic there of how they're able to rotate through the ultimates that they have, and they're charging them up very, very quickly. So first round going to go over here to the Boston Uprising, but there is still a second round to go. Twilight, though, I can only imagine this is like one of the snipes yeah, right there onto Rocket. Ooh. I was like, how did Twilight hit that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, those no. antis were crazy. We talked about it before, too. He got the snipe real quick and then got that huge anti from across the field. Now we go on to round number two. Going to teleport real quick to get to that middle point as quickly as possible. But Uprising looking so good, even after their last game. They are warmed up. They are ready to go. Although I say that, and Twi Twilight gets immediately taken down by Chopper fighting out inside of this close quarter room will on the other side does not do the uprising justice and Wisp can take a little bit of a breather here while Lee Gong tries to go for a reset. Yeah, I mean, this was such a smart target focus there coming in from Wisp. Everybody started to dive onto Twilight in the back line, just recognizing how much Twilight's Ana has really been able to help keep the Boston Uprising up and also enable their engagements. But a big anti now, poor Jakaru is not going to be able to get away from that one. Lee Jagon can't get away from Rocky either. Going for those trades, but Twilight's still up and alive to keep the rest of the Uprising alive. They're going to take the back end while Smurf disrupts the piece in the front lines. Chopter with this off angle here while Graves gets taken out by Bird Ring. See the contention coming in, but I like the, the positioning that we specifically had from Chopper and Twilight. Bird Ring managed to nail him with the magnetic nade and Rocket is anti. He gets away in time before Decay cuts him off on the other side. Uprising flip up this point and Wisp do go in for a good disengage here, but they will be able to come back with the Nana Boost. Yeah, they get the Nano Boost online, and they also have the Pulse Bomb up and ready to go. So I feel like that's a great way that Wisp, as long as they don't take too long here to allow for Boston Uprising to get ultimates of their own online, then maybe they can take advantage of that. But Twilight's going to use the Nano first. I think with these antis have been definitely on point for this second round. He gets immediately focused down by Smurf. He did put down that, that Nano, and Smurf now clears the space with the frill and the fact that he's on this prime. Always going to be able to jump right back on top of the bridge, and the deed is done. More time wasted away from Wisp after Uprising were able to flip that point. Yeah, they didn't need much to be able to get the job done either. It was just the Nano and the Primal, and now they still have the Pulse Bomb and the Deadeye to be able to cycle through. And the Deadeye is so good at being able to create space, so as soon as Whisper are able to move in, you're going to see Birdring try to get into a position to just save everybody off. Well, I, unless Jakaru has something to say about that one, I guess. <laughs> Especially on the on the bridge right there, too. Here comes a sound barrier to keep uprising in this fight to start the engagement right now. They try to nail down a peek, but the sound barrier from Graves ends up helping them out, but not before Jakaru goes down first. The post bomb stick onto Chopper. Look at Decay playing passively around the barrier, though. I love his positioning. Rocket now gets the post bomb stick. Burgering goes down. Rocket going crazy on the back line from Wisp onto Uprising here. This is looking great here for Wisp. It's looking so good for Wisp right now. I mean, they are able to get the point flip. Also, the Wrecking Ball choice might be exactly what they need. Something a little bit more wonky, maybe a little bit more outside of the box, and it makes it a little bit faster for Jakaru to be able to get these rotations in versus having to rely on the cooldowns that Winston has to offer. So you're going to see Jakaru go ahead and get set up there as he just goes bowling through the entire team. Oh, no strike, and the stick, and the sleep oh, on top of that. Oh, Goodbye, oh. Bird Ring, so long, but Lee Jae Gon answered right back. They were so fixated on Bird Ring that look where Lee Jae Gon was sharking from on the other side of that bridge. Huge trade going in favor for the Uprising. Yeah, wait, what? Vicky, I feel like every focus was on to Bird Ring there, and then Lee Jae Gon out of nowhere gets the double boop of his life. 
So Boston Uprising, they're able to take back control of this point now, and Twilight's wow. gonna go ahead and use the Nano. Smurf can't get no this off. Way. What? Oh, but that was still a huge anti. Jakaro also went to sleep. Twilight having a ball game right here while Smurf is absent. Now we see the face off between Decay and Rocket. Rocket's incredibly low. He can't get away. Burbring follows up with that too. Uprising with control over this point. Wisp is gonna have to get Jakaro to desperately touch. Yeah, Jakaru is going to have to be able to make a move in, but he's already so low there. Chopper is able to get the nano boost, but is that going to be able to convert over to anything? Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> Somebody needs to stop Lee Jagon. Chopper comes in, finding two right here, which is huge, but Smurf has a prime. He's going to go for the reset. Pulse Bomb coming in, special delivery. Chopper gets sent to the other side. Doesn't get sent all the way down to the desk, but he manages to survive. And the sound barrier from Lee Jae Gon keeps the rest of Uprising alive in this fight. So does Grapes have matched that. They're looking up and alive and healthy. The same can't be said for Decay. 85% with this flip from Wisp. Yo, look at that too. Jakaru has the minefield ready to go as well. So you can just lay that down as soon as Boston Uprising tried to make their way back onto this point. Smurf with a quick pick over to the Doomfist just to be able to get back to point a little bit faster. But Jakaru is getting ready to let those mines loose. Sets the overtime is Decay here. He's got the Pulse Bomb ready. Twilight on the Kiri. The time ticking away here with a minefield going down from Jakaru. It's going to be huge in clearing the space. Decay just waiting for an opportunity to continuously harass his backline. Nice Susan here too. Chopper being able to find Smurf is going to be big. How's Burbank and Decay going to use his Pulse Bomb and this Deadeye? It's going to be incredibly important here. Still harassing the backline while Chopper goes unchecked. He finds Burbank. Decay goes down and Wisp successfully get this point right back in his favor and get the second round. That was so back and forth between both of these teams, but ultimately came down to that wrecking ball pick as soon as Jakaru came out of the gates with that one I felt like Wisp woke up and had a completely different game Vicky definitely agree there and the fact that he had mines for that final fight was also incredibly important because yeah. it denied the space that Decay needed to not only try to continuously press forward on the point but he also had to take different angles to harass the back line here's Chopper with the quick 2k onto Burgering and Twilight Looking heads real quick here too. Wisp, this is the, the Rocket Chopper DPS duo that we highlighted yesterday, Necra, that is so good. They work really well together and they have that synergy and it was displayed at the very end of that fight. Yeah, and I think the Chopper is really woken up as a player to be able to play this Cassidy. I feel like this is something where he can really shine. And so to be able to see that Nano Boost help get that 2K, oh, wow. I think that was really impressive. But uh, I think all the players of Wisp right now are stuck between a May Wall and a Hard Place. Uh, yeah, that Immortality Field from Twilight was really big too for that first engagement, for that first fight. Now the point going in favor for Uprising, but it's fine, Wisp. They were able to make that comeback in that last round. Gets blocked off by the Maywall, which is going to be incredibly detrimental in this matchup here, especially trying to get through that choke point. Nice anti from Abkeek here too, but Jakaru goes down first, and Smurf is taking a quick nap, but I like Burbring holding these different angles. Yeah, Birdring is basically just locking down both points of entry right now that can that Wisp can go through. It's either going to be that main checkpoint there, or if you see him kind of look off to the right, then you can see him try to get some taps in there as well. But a little bit of a disengage here coming through from the Boston Uprising. Too many members of Wisp were able to make it through that main checkpoint. So you kind of just have to give it up a little bit to be able to make sure you can contest the actual point. And the Nana Boost coming in onto Jokaru. We've seen this done before, and this is how they start their engagements. Finding Bird Ring is gonna be big here, and Twilight after he used the amp right there too. Big window going down, and I like how they were able to disengage, get out of that line of sight while Jakaru was still pressing onto those back lines. Finding another pick now into Decay here. Uprising are probably gonna have to reset, and they will, as Wisp is gonna be able to flip this point. Yeah, the composition that Boston Uprising are running there with the May and the Ramatra, when you know that you have that shield available, it's really great to be able to cycle through the shield as well as the May wall in order to help block off or isolate one of the members on the opposing team. So Wisp, you know, they were able to make it through that highly defensive composition there from Boston, but Boston are coming back with a ton of ultimates. That's four in the bank right now, Vicky. And they have the sound barrier. If Grape stays alive, he could get one up for this fight. Here comes the Deadeye as Bird Ring finds Jakaru. Huge here. 
Nice immortality field helps reset Smurf, but he doesn't get out of the line of sight of Chopper's Deadeye. He goes down without being able to use the Annihilation. Here comes that Sound Barrier. Legion got managed to pull it off. The Anti, though, is huge from Abkeek and great matches at Sound Barrier, too. But currently, Whips are fighting these traits. Uprising have the number advantage, but with Jakaru still alive and having the Primal, Uprising want to get this reset. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Jakaru was able to get so much mileage out of those Tesla cannons from the Winston and being able to also you just flatten a couple members out of the Boston Uprising doesn't necessarily hurt to be able to pick up the rest of those squishies. Decay is actually going to be making a bit of an adjustment here. Going to swap off of the May onto the Tracer. So we're going to see more similar compositions coming through here as the Boston Uprising come back. See the Nata boost to Jikaru. He's got the Primal ready to go in for another reset. So need be. He gets stuck though right here. The Ascent Annihilation comes in from Smurf, but he gets immediately shut down by Abkeek. He's been on point, not only with these antis, but these sleeps onto Smurf have been huge. Another anti now into Decay, but Uprising were able to flip the point there, which is big, because you already see Wiz at 78%. They get the trade. Lee Jae Gon going down, so does Jikaru. We'll have Jikaru for this fight. Bird Ring, too, gets pinged, and Twilight trying to take a different off angle. He already used up that Ant Matrix, but he was in a nice position where he wasn't going to get dove on after getting hit with an anti. Smurf was a difference maker here, with Jikaru not being able to make his way back. He does flip over to the line. Yeah, I mean, the Reinhardt's going to be really nice here to be able to help hold up that shield for all of this incoming damage coming through from both Twilight and Bird Ring. But that also means that the shield is going to dissipate super quickly, and Bird oh. Ring's just going to go ahead and weave in a Deadeye. And with Smurf being in that nemesis form, punching right through, Jekaru had to back away, and he was in that line of sight of Bird Ring, who just finished the job. 98%, nobody in sight from Whistle, and Grimms, who tried to push it into overtime, successfully does so, while Jekaru rolls right in with that quick swap from the ball that we saw in the last round. Yeah, the Wrecking Ball is going to be able to retouch for the overtime, but it, it, it looks like it might still be disaster here for Wisp, but especially once the sound barrier gets put down. EJ Gon is zooming. He says, forget about whatever you saw earlier. There was no Ajax. I'm here. And he was flying through the sky, uprising, coming in with that sound barrier, staying alive, clearing out Wisp, and taking map number one. But Wisp were holding on for a long time. They look like zombies coming in in waves. Yeah, I mean, holy moly. I feel like the fact that Wisp is able to take that second round as well is just a huge testament to how much Wisp really wants to be able to contend with the best. And so really exciting to be able to see them actually get a round win there. But Boston Uprising still coming out on top in this very first map. I mean, Vicky, what did you make of that? The, the Wrecking Ball choice, super, super cool there. I mean, Wisp just, they looked good. It, it was great, but man, there is such a, a difference maker in the amount of elims that we were seeing coming out from Uprising. I think That's true. from what we see from Decay alone, I think he like rounded around Rocket by double the amount of elims that he was able to get. Look at that turnaround. It was disgusting onto Chopper, trying to back away into the health pack. Nothing was going to save him there, too. It was a nice look here from Twilight as well in that first round. We saw that snipe and this huge anti coming in from the back line. Yeah, I mean, that was just, it looks like a Hail Mary, but it was so calculated to be able to allow Smurf to just get the clean up there with Decay as well. But then Lee Jae gone just out of nowhere with the double poop. Vicky, there were so many incredible moments there. <laughs> Lee Jae gone still gets out scot-free, being able to go back to the rest of the team. And he did it not once, but he did it twice, too. We saw him nail down uh, a peak at one point. Yeah. It was nice to see here, too. Bird Ring coming in as well with the Deadeye, just trying to get into position thanks to Lee Jae Gon. And immediately, point blank, finds Jikaru. Uprising take that first map. It was uh, two to one. Nice look here from Wisp. They were trying to fight at their best, but unfortunately, their best was not enough. Let's see if map number two could be a little different for this team after this break.
Welcome back, everyone. We just saw Uprising take it to home in that round against Wisp, and that was really nice to see Wisp put up a pretty good fight. 2-1, rather. Really nice fight against Wisp. Wisp not going down, though, without that fight, Necro. I'm excited to see what we got in our hands for the second map. I'm so excited as well, especially because we're getting a bit of a substitution coming in here from the Boston Uprising. It's going to be Izayaki subbing in there for Legion Gone. And we saw this look from them earlier on today in their most mm -hmm. recent match where Izayaki came in and we ended up seeing the Baptiste and the Kiriko out of the back line for both of these players. So, Vicky, knowing that our next map is going to be King's Row, what do you make of both of these players coming into the roster? We can expect the Zen to definitely come out because I do believe Uprising is starting off on the defense. So then he has a lot more room to work with. And we also have a tool to deal with Rocket. We're going to be able to make sure we can mark down Jakaru. Uh, not that they had an issue with it in that last round, but we saw the stall coming in from Wisp. And we also saw Jakaru make that swap over to the ball. So this is going to be interesting to see with this sub. Yeah, especially because Wisp are going to be the ones that chose this map of King's Row. And so I wonder what they do have up their sleeve. We saw Reinhardt picked there really quickly there by Jakaru before we ended up actually seeing the Wrecking Ball come back out there on Control Center. Uh, so maybe there's a little bit of a Reinhardt angle that we could see Wisp try to go for in this next map. But I feel like when it comes down to just Boston Uprising being able to play this defense, I would love to see that Zenyatta out of Izayaki. Izayaki ended up putting on such a phenomenal performance with that hero last season and there's some great places for them to defend from like you mentioned vicky i love how you bring up izayaki's background i mean th this man has three stage titles under his belt and a ring like this is gonna be fun to see <laughs> this is why when i look at boss and uprising roster i was in disbelief when i saw the announcement and then i get to see them again and it's like i got whiplash it's like wow i'm having a fever <laughs> dream this is this is an insane all-star roster we get to see it in full force you know, we talk about Izayaki, you talk about his history with Lee Jae Gon, obviously, both of that back line coming in from the Shanghai Dragons, but coming in with Twilight for this round, sticking with Twilight and Twilight's Ana. Excited to see how this is going to go. And we talked about Izayaki's Zen. He's probably going to make this sw swap yeah, real quick to the Kiri this time around, though. So different look here than we were expecting that from. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of thinking anything support wise that has a high mechanical skill so you're looking at kiriko baptiste uh, zenyatta any three of those i feel it could be such a phenomenal pick there for izayaki and i think the kiriko makes a lot of sense in this particular instance because izayaki with those kunai are gonna be hitting so hard vicky especially if you're able to like land those in the dome of anybody that's on wisp i feel like you're gonna be be you're gonna be able to delete people out of the server and i feel like that's what boston really want to do here with this composition is they want to win fast and 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 hard i guess <laughs> <laughs> Especially seeing how they were getting marked down by Rocket and Chopper in that last map. Seeing how they're going to play this positioning. The Graves trying to take a cheeky angle. They try to sandwich them over on the other side with Jay Carr trying to jump into the high ground. Ziaki forced to reposition here. Gets right back in. I like this positioning that we're seeing. Jakaru getting hit with a huge anti while Burgering takes care of Chopper. You gotta look to your backs while you leave yourself vulnerable here. Wish was trying to contest so hard for that high ground, but they left themselves vulnerable to both Burgering and Decay in the back. I can't believe Smurf got away with that. Did you just notice that Smurf was at like yeah. 20 HP and then left? on a whim was able to get healed back up that did actually get a lot of charge over for twilight to be able to work towards that nano boost quickly but i mean the way that boston uprising are controlling the space right now is just really oh. fun to watch oh poor twilight's gonna have to get out of there though rocket just has his number permanently Oh, but Izayaki immediately getting right on top of Twilight Decay, cleaning up what was dropped from the high ground. He is clearing up everything while Wisp drop after trying to reposition from the amount of pressure that Uprising has put down. That was beautiful play right there from Decay. Yeah, oh my gosh. I mean, we got to watch this again because the replay here, we didn't get a chance to see everything that happened, but Decay just from the rafters shooting down as soon as Smurf has a Tesla cannon on them. That's a big target there for Decay to follow up. Already going to have the Pulse Bomb online as Smurf's going to hold down the front line here, waiting for Decay to find a mark. Oh, wow. And he did it right there with the Pulse Bomb stuck onto Chopper. Then Burgering takes care of Jakaru. 
This is dominating here. Whisper trying to take this split approach to try to find these backlines from Uprising, but then you have to worry about Decay, who's harassing your backline, who's doing a really good job of preventing your backline from even reaching you. And then Bird Ring finishes off the job with Smurf just getting the follow-up. One of the things I really love about the Kiriko here from Izayaki is honestly the mobility that she provides to this team. Like, look at how many angles wow. Izayaki is able to grab here. Twilight even getting in on the action as well, but but there's also a great escape mechanism here for Izayaki on the Kiriko. So not only are you able to do damage, but if you really need to, you can also teleport away to the rest of your team. And we've seen that already displayed from Izayaki, and look at the amount of ults they have online. They can match up with Wisp, who's about to get Sound Barrier 2. Izayaki getting away, but gets chased down. Here comes Anata Boost coming in. Izayaki has different plans. Here comes all the damage that you were talking about earlier before Necro. Birdman gets hit with a huge anti Jikaru coming in with the Primal. Means loads of a difference because Brakes used a Sound Barrier, so he helped him get into position. But the answer back immediately from Izayaki, because he was able to stay alive, was able to clear up their back line. So we basically flipped the script right here for Uprising, where, yeah, you managed to get two picks, Shikaru, but Smurf is able to get two, and so does Izayaki. I mean, the, I mean, the fact that Izayaki and Smurf just never went down there, they were able to help each other out. Not only wow. did Izayaki keep Smurf alive, be able to go in with the Primal, be able to get a lot of those jump pack kills. Now you get a chance to see the rest of the team come back, and despite the fact that the Dragon Strike is going to go through and get Twilight, Izayaki is is still up. How much healing can he pump into the team? A cheeky angle there from Chopper in that Dragon Strike. Getting two <laughs> is big there because that would have been two impactful ults, especially with the way that Zuke was trying to press onto those back lines. He was trying to reposition there. Chopper gets another one onto Izayaki, who's absolutely popping off. And now's the opportunity with less than 10 seconds for Wisp to get that payload moving. Yeah, I mean, it looks like the payload is going to get unlocked here, but Smurf might be looking for an angle to come back in. Look at that. A little bit of a jump there from Decay. It's going to have to no be the time. No way. Coming in from the heavens and another stick there, too. Coming in, too. Murdering Smurf. Decay get taken down. Overtime taking away. That was a nice entrance from Decay, but Uprising are now falling while Rocket is trying to clean up what is left of Izayaki. That looks so risky. Vicky, it almost paid off. You could see DK try to go in, be able to stall a little bit for Smurf to get the jumps online to be able to make it back to the point as well, but it just wasn't quite executed the way that Boston Uprising would have liked it to be. Bird Ring got stuck there, and so ultimately you weren't able to use the Deadeye and the shields in the way there by Jakaru. What a well-timed bubble and great placement of that shield in order to make sure that Whisper able to stay alive to get this payload unlocked. And, and look how much ultimate charge they walked away with there too, Vicky. I mean, you're gonna have the Primal Rage, the Nano, the Sound Barrier. Wisp have so many tools at their disposal now from all the ult charge they have grabbed. I love how you pointed that out here too. You see the Nano Boost now being used up onto Jakaru. He's gonna back away in time, but it's clearing out this corner that is their priority here. It's an easy corner to get stuck in and Smurf, same thing now. Here's a Nano Boost. He's gonna be able to hold forward. He's got that Primal in case he needs to go for the reset at the end of that Nano Boost. He's gonna have to be forced to pop it here. Good position to do that too because the payload is still moving around by the way while they're fixated on what's happening in the front lines here while smurf is able to get away but decay now managing to find your car in the process to get that follow-up yeah and it's just going to be a standstill at this point especially when it's going to be a few of the uh, squishier heroes here trying to duke it out on the cart but ultimately this is where the payload is going to stop for now as the rest of the members of Wisp try to make their way back. And unfortunately, you know, they did have to use the Primal as well as the Nano there. But now they have three more ultimates to rotate through, especially if Chopper's able to get this dead eye online. He almost got that cheeky full spawn stick onto the back line. Grapes also has that sound bear that he's able to activate. Meanwhile, Smurf gets hit with the anti, gets deleted from Chopper. Rocket is going crazy at the second checkpoint. Love what we're seeing for, between him and a peak and Grace putting him to position while they clean up the rest of Uprising. You can see the confidence beaming right through Rocket. Absolutely. I mean, Rocket's been absolutely killing it today. Absolutely crushing it. And to be able to see Rocket in peak form right now, not only have these pulse bombs been able to convert over, but they've been able to get some really big picks. Boston Uprising, though, Vicky, they're back. They want to contest this. 
Here comes a big anti coming in from Twilight onto Jakaru and Graves, and it allows Birdring to get that Elim onto Graves. Now here comes a leap in from Smurf. He gets hit with the anti, but Jakaru falls incredibly low. Be trying to get away in time while Birdring cleans up what is left of Jakaru. Nobody now left here while they need to clean up Rocket, who's been a menace to Uprising. But the rest of Wiz have nothing to do with Birdring. The dead eye to clear the entire alleyway. They do get stopped right there next to that second checkpoint, though, Never. Yeah, Boston Uprising have done a great job in this series of being able to try to come back in at the very last second to contest. It didn't quite work out for them on that very first checkpoint, but for the second one, it definitely worked out for them to be able to stop that payload from activating the third piece of this map. But now that we're switching sides here, I mean, Boston, they played such an aggressive defensive game. They were really trying to be proactive there, moving in first to try to beat Wisp to the punch when they were coming back in. Um, and so I love to see that maybe they're gonna try to play an aggressive game on the attack as well. I like how you bring that up too, with the way that Yuzyaki was playing, especially before Wisp was able to get that first point, he was going crazy. I think he had more Elims than both Decay and Bird Ring at one point, the very beginning. Gets that snipe onto Graves. Jekaru was doing a really good job with this Primal to clear the front lines, but then with Yuzyaki right behind Jekaru and then Smurf popping Primal right afterwards, this was a difference maker right here. They split up the rest with Wisp. In the very end, they do manage to get that payload, but that was a really nice look for Wiz to at least try to split up the Uprising, but Uprising answering back almost immediately afterwards. Yeah, I feel like there's been such a nice call and response there. Uprising clearly have the veterancy behind them and all of their players, and so they know how to make these quick reactions to whatever type of scenario is in front of them. So maybe, yes, the the reaction time was there to be able to try to come back and get that contest on the first point. And, but I mean, we're able to see some displays of that throughout all of the team fights that we've seen so far. And looking on the other side of the coin, we gotta give our contenders team some loves out here. Rocket was doing a For fantastic sure. job at trying to take different off angles, was getting cleanups on these Elims when he was trying to push forward beyond that second checkpoint. But Libby died three times on that attack and was trying to match that with Decay, who did die four times, uh, but he was doing a really good job at trying to match with Jakaro. The follow-ups that we've seen from Rocket and Jakaro have been another level. But here we have Decay popping off on the high ground, finishing off what he already pressed on onto Grapes, who tried to get away and couldn't successfully do so. But between Decay and the damage output that we saw, Twilight with a lot of these antis, Smurf popped in the Primal, and Isiaki's damage output, Uprising looked incredibly difficult to break through that barrier to get that payload. And I think that's honestly, though, why this has been so impressive to me that Whisper putting up this much of a fight, right? Every single time that we've really seen Boston Uprising, even just in this most previous match, they've looked damn impressive. Let's just put it that way, right, Vicky? Boston Uprising looked really, really good to kick off this season, but that is why I feel like Wisp deserve a lot of credit here to actually make it to this point where they took a round off of Boston. They're giving them a run for their money here, being able to take these points, even if it is going to be in overtime here. And I think that says and speaks a lot to how long this particular roster for Wisp has been together. They might have struggled a little bit in terms of being able to contend with some of the maybe top of the top teams in North American contenders, but they are still putting on a heck of a show, and I can't wait to see how they're going to approach this defense round. Yeah, you talk about the history. Chopper has been part of that Rush Bible team way back when yeah. he used to cast <laughs> contenders. I mean, you talk about the history that these players have, but against these insane titans that are uprising, Decay is the first one to go down by Chopper. We're just talking about him. We gave him some of that energy. But Chopper answers right back to Bird Ring right after Bird Ring was able to take care of Abkeek. They get that trade. Jakaru's taking a nap. Wiz doing a good job at trying to displace Uprising, but the reset has already happened here for Wiz while they try to focus down on that player on their back. Yeah, and I think what's really hard about this particular defense here is that everybody on Wisp has just been split up, so a lot of 1v1s are happening across the board, and Boston Uprising, they have the mechanical uh -huh. skill in their favor right now. But as I say that, Decay actually being forced to recall here as the rest of Wisp get ready to regroup. 
Takara helping out Rocket after he gets anti, though. Get down, Mr. President. He helped him out once, and Jakaro can't say the same here as he gets burned down by Bird Ring, followed up by Smurf. Bird Ring doing such a good job in the back. Nobody can help out Rocket. He fell incredibly low. Fortunately, blinked right into that wall behind him. And Uprising are going to be able to get this payload with a good amount of time in their pocket. Yeah, and especially when you look at the ultimates that they're starting to rack up in the bank. Decay has the pulse bomb ready to go. Looking at trying to get down this Winston bubble and maybe sticking that pulse bomb onto a low health target. And then, I mean, it's basically going to be a full slate here, Vicky. Look at that. Nano, Kitsune Rush, you got the Primal, Bird Rings could have the Dragons. I uh, Pick, pick, pick your, <laughs> pick your poison here. What's going to be getting thrown out? And they know it too. You see whiffs, they saw Decay trying to be cheeky, trying to find an opportunity with that pulse. Here comes that Nano, mentioned now, coming in from a peak. But Jakaru sleeping while Smurf is popping the Primal, finding the back line of Wisp. Uprising are clearing what is left of Wisp on this choke point, and this looks difficult. Now you don't have that Nano, you're gonna have Sound Barrier. Yeah, you didn't pop Primal here after you lost out on your back line, but Uprising have so much to work with. Yeah, Uprising have a lot of tools left in their kit here. Look at how Smurf was able to just absolutely handle this corner of the map, getting a huge juggle there onto Grapes. Abheek to follow it up, just absolutely dismantling the back line there of Wisp. But now this is their last chance, Vicky. Boston could shut it down here and take the series. Oh, they are so far up here to make sure that they clear up this next point here too. Decay with that Pulse Bomb, still holding on to it while the rush was used up from Easy Yacht. Here comes Nano coming in too. Nice anti from Upkeek, but Jakaru once again gets put to sleep. Upkeek gets taken down while Decay is still hunting in this back line. Nowhere to run for Grapes. Upkeek and Grapes have not been able to breathe once with Decay being around. No, it's so tough to be able to do that too. I mean, Decay is an absolute menace in the back line. You can see how much cleanup has been coming through from this player, especially when Smurf is going to be able to kind of tickle everybody down oh. to being able to finish up. And that's it. Vicky, Wisp can't touch. Oh, uh, I thought Chopper was going to be able to get at least close enough with Grapes right behind him with the speed boost. But nope, not one toe on that point. Not going to contest there. And... Boston Uprising looking at their peak form after today I and mean, a clean 2-0 versus the Gladiators are now taking that series versus Wiz. Yeah, it's been a phenomenal day here for the Boston Uprising to just give us a little bit of a teaser of what's to come for the rest of the season. We're still going to get a chance to see a little bit more from both Wisp and Boston Uprising for the rest of the weekend, but I'm excited. I feel like when you take a look across the board at Boston Uprising, the players that they have accumulated, uh, basically like the... I don't know, the Avengers here of, of the Overwatch <laughs> League. Like, I feel like it's really cool to see this roster come together. And we got to give the play of the match here to Decay after all of those impressive Tracer plays. But talking about him right before that match ended for a reason. He was a menace out here, putting in the pressure, making sure that Apeek and Grips were not having a very fun time out here. And also, got to talk about the communication that we definitely saw coming in between him and Twilight. I like the anti follows that we saw with Smurf whenever he was down. You saw Decay cleaning up what was left or would jump in with Smurf. Very good follows that we saw here from Decay and different off angle positioning. That was nice. Breaking next out here, gets the recall and then finishes off what was left of Grips at the very end. Decay having a phenomenal game versus Wiz. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even despite everything that you saw there from Decay, I feel like Wisp, they, yes, Decay was giving them so much difficulty, but Wisp's all of their players still got a chance to have some really fun spotlight moments. But it's so tough to contend against a player that is as good, as deadly as Decay really has been. Didn't die very often, very self-sufficient, mm -hmm. and also ended up being able to convert over to quite a few pulse bomb kills every single time that that pulse bomb was up. 3.3 deaths? Are you kidding me? After a pretty close Legion game two, where it was back and forth, I think he really died three times in that first map. Love this look that we're seeing from the Boston Uprising. We talk about murdering a lot. We've got to give that love over to Decay because he had a fantastic showing in that last series. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in to that final series. We're going to toss it over to the desk to get their thoughts on that final match.
Thank you guys so much. Uh, always great to hear from the two of them and always great to hear them calling the shots and all the action. We're back for the Watchpoint Post Show now. As over here, joined by Danny and Matt Morello. We've got uh, jaw-dropping highlights. We've got scourging hot takes sometimes. And always. the two gentlemen will break <laughs> it all down for you. Oh, oh, yeah, I don't know about that. that oh, yeah, what I do know, though. No, no, no. <laughs> and lots of birds. You never know. <laughs> no, 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 no. You never, never know. know. <laughs> Might hit you by surprise yeah. that one. But uh, yeah, we just wrapped the last match of the day. Wisp took on the Boston Uprising. And I mean, honestly, though, Lee Jang, Lee Jang Tower was rather entertaining. I was entertained. Yeah, yeah. Wisp wasn't going down without a fight. I think they made some really smart compositional changes, uh, switching in the ball there, and they almost managed to edge it out. Lee J got it. He is going forward. Uh, you see here, nice boop off the side. Uh, at one point, he was doing a little like war zone type move where he's sitting in a bush. <laughs> yeah, right here. He's sitting in a bush coming out of the side. Just, uh, you know, just really nice movement. Uh, this level of aggression, though, is uh, not normal uh, for you know, Lucio. It's like, yeah, he's right in. here. I, I mean, it's like he was like a car on Oasis Highway, just a flat line that day. Uh, so, I mean, uh, can you continue this level of aggression and not be punished? Uh, I actually no. thought Wisp, Wisp hung in there pretty well uh, yeah. you know, throughout this series. I actually thought they put up a really good fight. Uh, just here on Lee Jing Tower, I mean, Lee Jing Gama is unreal. Yeah, I mean, this kind of aggression, I, I sincerely doubt we would see that against a lot of other teams uh, in OWL at least. So it does look like Boston Uprising was trying to have a little bit more fun with it. Lee J Gon uh, Tower was actually also known as Lee J Gon Tower uh, for, for quite some time. So rightfully so. Yeah, gotta pay up. So that sound barrier the into the, 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 the kill the punch. He is... He was, he, was, he was zooming. He was zooming around. Yeah. He was. So, so what, did you, what, what did you want to check out my, my Twitter? It's a banger. <laughs> that, that tweet nah. so, didn't that get as so much funny. traction as it should have. The last day so he's <laughs> verified, so go check it out. <laughs> yeah, before I have to pay for it, which I want. But uh, we're living for now. Uh, anyway, oh, we do have an interview ready for all of you. Unfortunately, it won't be birdring though, which is a little bit disappointing. Oh. What was what? Let's maybe let's maybe interview you first here. Why? Why? Yeah, did interview you talk me. To birdring who, who is you? Uh, is that me or is that Danny? <laughs> no, it's me. Of course, Danny. it's me. When, when Zoe says you, then it's me. What's of your course. What's uh, your thought <laughs> process of choosing your interview partners? Oh, uh, you know, it's, it's you know, I think we we've heard enough about uh, from birdring. I think two interviews in a day was enough, and it's. It started to, after the second interview, it started to feel like it was just all one whole interview. Felt very. I, I hear what you're saying, <laughs> but I think <laughs> Matt officially dubbed today the official day of birdering. So it's actually uh, it a national holiday now. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bank okay. holiday. Bird, it's a uh, bird day. Bird day? <laughs> Birthday. Today's birthday, but hey, I think I think Tuesday. And because Boston Bur Uprising, they have, they have so many great players. I think it's good to I talk to someone else. But at the same time, honestly, <laughs> I feel like they're going to get way more wins. So, even if we yeah. did burn yeah. for the third I'm time. I'm sure we get an opportunity <laughs> to talk to all of them many a times. And uh, that is a big joy of that. I always love picking their brains. It's also been really, really great for us generally in the pro -M. I don't know if you heard, Matt, but we got a lot of insight from a lot of the coaches as well. So I hope to hear yeah. more of that since we do have still quite some game days uh, coming your way here in the pro -M tournament. But for now, we are ready to head into our winner's interview you in this one it's not gonna be murdering but another legend in his own right it's dk thank you so much so dk hello can you hear me dk is also three now so i'm on to say i asked dk to wave us that he did thank you so much for that cute wave dk all right i'm just gonna jump right into the question so i mean you guys Look, dominant again against Whip, Wisp. This was your second match, but you guys did drop a round uh, on Lee Jang. So I want to ask you about that. What happened? What sort of problems uh, did you, were you guys facing in round two? I think it was Garden. So, 첫 번째 질문은 오늘도 지금 두 번째 경기도 굉장히 좋은 모습으로 승리를 거두셨는데요. 어, 그래도 어, 첫 번째 맵이었던 리 장에서 특히나 그 정원이었죠. 그래서 아쉽게 어, 그 라운드를 어, 패배를 하셨는데. 어 정원에 좀 어떤 문제점이 있었고 또이 문제점을 좀 어떻게 고쳐 나가셨나요? 어 일단 
상대 팀이 생각보다 좀 공격적으로 계속 플레이를 하더라고요. 먼저 뭘 무언가를 하려고 하고 그래가지고 좀 저번 때는 그게 대처가 잘안 됐는데 이제 좀 정원 끝나고 뭐 이제 어차피 정원은 이제 끝났고 이제 뭐 메일을 하다 보니까 또그 조합에서는 저희가 좀 그래도 잘 한다 생각하기 때문에 그냥 하던 대로 했습니다. 하던 대로. 알겠습니다. Uh, I think the biggest problem that we were facing was that we were just cut off guard. Uh, we didn't know that while we were playing against Wisp in Gardens that they were going to be that aggressive and that was sort of a surprise for us. But after losing that round, you know, we just said, hey, it's just a round. It's already done. Let's forget about it. We just had to brush it off, uh, start fresh, and then I think we just carried on that way and we got the win. Uh, and of course, uh, I mean, you guys are already, this was your first time showing and you guys already won two matches. To K, I just want to hear your opinion. Is there like a team in the Pro-Am that you really want to beat? 자, 오늘 첫 경기 뿐만 아니라 두 번째 경기까지 해서 벌써 반, 이번 그룹 스테이지에서 반 이상의 경기를, 딱 반이고 다반 경기를 끝나셨는데 어, DK 선수가 보시기에 지금 프로엠 토너먼트에서 어, 개인적으로 이 팀만은 우리 보스턴 팀이 꼭 이겨야겠다, 이기고 싶다 하는 팀이 좀 있을까요? 어 저는 일단 애틀란타는 좀 이, 개인적으로 이기고 싶은 마음이 있습니다. 이게 왜냐면 이제 뭐전 팀원이었던 비질란테 선수도 있고 그 이번에 또 새로 이제 립 선수나 스토커 선수도 또 잘하는 선수라고 알고 있기 때문에 그 선수들이랑 해서 이기면 또 저희 팀이 더 좋은 모습이 되지 않을까 싶어서 그렇게 생각합니다. Okay, uh, I do have to go with the Atlanta range just because, you know, my former teammate, uh, Vigilante, is there. Not only that, they got great players like Lip and Stalker. I know how great they are. Just Atlanta Reign is also a very stacked roster, so beating them would make us look better and would put us on top of them. So that's why I want to play against Atlanta Reign. All right, that is it for the interview, DK. Thank you so much for your time. And again, big congratulations on both, on winning both of your matches. 자, 오늘 두 승리 너무나 축하드리면서 인터뷰 마치도록 하겠습니다. DK 선수, 감사합니다. 네, 감사합니다. Bye bye, DK. Thank you so much, Danny. Fantastic interview as always. And it's great to hear from the man himself. An absolute menace on the tracer amongst other heroes. So I am excited to see more of him and the team moving forward in the Pro-M. For now, let's take a look at today's results to see where we landed after three matches. Again, we had to make some uh, schedule changes as uh, one of the teams unfortunately could not join us, but the makeup matches will be played very soon. These are the scores. I don't think there were any hot surprises here. This is no. pretty much uh, all going according to the plan. Yeah, I, I don't think today with the matches that we had, there was anything surprising at all. Uh, you know, that top of uh, you know, Group C is going to be uh, pretty uh, tightly contested, although that match uh, that ended up happening right between uh, Glads and Uprising, I'm sure it's going to be uh, huge for tiebreak uh, scenarios. And then... Uh, now, in the other group, didn't really get to see anything move today. Um, it'll be exciting to see Defiant go back at it again, hopefully tomorrow. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, which uh, brings us, of course, to our next very big segment, which I personally, it's, it's a favorite of mine. What can I say? It's the big takeaways, the learnings, the headlines. I want to know what what really tickled you today like what, what what is the word on the street danny for you for me the word of the street is that dante is a great tank for the uh, los angeles gladiators wow. i mean you know like he said in his interview yesterday he said he was a bit stressed because he had to pick up a lot of different heroes because he is the sole tank and that has been a big question mark going into yesterday even even today too can Dante, as the sole tank for the Los Angeles Gladiators, Gladiators, is that enough? And honestly, for the matches that we've seen today, I think he was he was doing a fantastic job. I love mm -hmm. the switch onto the Zarya as well to counter Kalios' Diva in today's match against Boston. Sure, they lost this match, but Dante has been a fantastic have, has been doing a fantastic job, uh, you know, filling that tank role for the Gladiators. Yeah, I, yeah, no. I thought he was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're all in agreement then. Uh, Matt, what nice. was your big learning from this day? Uh, well, you know, Boston Uprising, 2-0. Bird Ring looked good. He looked back, you know, kind of like in form, like he never left. 
Uh, and I think that's awesome to see. Uh, you see Dora. I know he was on the cast last weekend. So he's very dead murdering uh, the four four team whiz. But uh, I, I thought they played really strong Boston. It was a, a roster that when everybody saw it got announced was like, oh, that's that's a really good roster. And then I, I feel like, you know, people have uh, you know, maybe gotten a little bit like less kind of, uh, you know, gung ho and hot on the roster. But uh, they came out today and they looked really strong. Uh, I think, you know, seeing this type of performance from Birdring uh, early on, really important, right? Uh, I know a lot of the players he was playing in, with uh, and against aren't even in the, the league anymore. Uh, so <laughs> to see him kind of come in, uh, put up a great performance on different heroes, uh, it w was really great to see. I, I think for me, for Boston, uh, you know, can you, you know, can you kind of like work out, know how this support line works, you know, with subs with like Izayagi coming in at times, uh, Lijay Gun going out, you know, maybe you keep Twilight in. Uh, and then also just uh, you know, make sure you kind of keep these players engaged, right? Like they, uh, they're they going to need to kind of like have that extra fuel and fire to get through the whole season. And like, where do you find that? So what I'm really hearing is you're worried that DK is not going to make it all season long. <laughs> I mean, they got a, I think, striker too, right? So why not? Yeah. <laughs> true, true. And if you want to hear uh, one of those voices of the naysayers, all you have to do is rewind the show, uh, listen to the pre-show, because Matt was not high on the boss Uprising. rising. I'm glad that their performance today changed his mind yeah, yeah. at least a little bit. Yeah, yeah, they proved him wrong. <laughs> That's right. Matt is wrong. It does happen every once in a while. But these are our big takeaways from today, and I'm sure there is much more Ooh. to learn tomorrow. So now let's have a look at what's coming up. We've got some great matches, a glorious six matches in fact as we make up the ones that we could not play today or at least some of them uh so i want to know which ones of these are making you burst with excitement all right i'm gonna go with both i i'm actually really excited to see uh, wisp versus team peps uh, i think it's gonna be an interesting clash of styles we know that peps loves to play the rhyme brawl and wisp like we saw likes to go winston you know i think it's gonna be an interesting matchup interesting contender team versus contender team uh, I'm excited to see Boston against Washington. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, a little bit of a decay revenge game there, you know, playing against uh, the Justice. Uh, you know, we've, uh, I think, some also kind of like staff and coaches and whatnot moving from Justice to Uprising. Uh, also, Lee J God and FD God, uh, they are just going to be very fast and aggressive. <laughs> They're going to be zooming. The uh, no healing done whatsoever. <laughs> Just send it. Well, if both, yeah, if both just send it, then I guess it's even Steven. Just gonna right? run so it down that, mid. Should, exactly, yeah. they're both gonna <laughs> run it down mid. I do love that though, that a lot of the top teams right now, or the teams that we consider some of the top teams with those really, really strong backlines, they're all strong backlines because they're insanely aggressive and so fast paced. So I'm very, very excited to see more of that. But that's it for today. We will be back tomorrow at 12 40 p.m. Pacific to preview all the action for all of you watching so for now we're gonna say good night stay hydrated and stay safe everyone thank you for joining bye bye